tape scripts for workbook. Unit 1 Lesson 1 Exercise 1 Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One, beta. Two, neat. Three, slip. Four, feet. Five, bit. Exercise 2 Distinguishing Liaisons Linking One My teachers really amuse me. Two That is kept confidential in the file cabinet. Three. The president's family lives in the White House. Four. According to my calendar, we have an appointment at three. Five. I'm going to print out the handouts for the geology class now. Exercise 3 Listen to the dialogue and answer questions 1 to 4. Hi! What time does class begin? 8.30, right? Oh, I thought it was 8.40. Let's check. Yeah, you're right. When do classes begin after lunch? One thirty. And they finish at 4.50. Let's meet at 5 o'clock for coffee. OK. Lesson 2. Exercise 1. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One. Heat. Two. Sit. Three. Feel. Four. Heel. Five. Nil. Exercise two. Distinguishing liaisons. Thinking. One. They were breeding like rabbits. Two. I don't enjoy getting either at all. Three. When exactly will they come? Four. My neighbours sued me often. Five. I don't think that essay is worthy. Exercise 3 Listen to the dialogue and answer questions 1 to 7.
Hello, this is Language International. Hello, I'd like some information about your German classes. We have three courses: beginner, intermediate, and business. I'm an intermediate level speaker, looking to improve my business vocabulary. The business course should be suitable for you. You can study in the evenings or at weekends. The course costs a hundred and eighty dollars. I'll take the weekend classes. I sometimes have to work overtime during the week. Can I pay when I come for the first class? Yes, the next course starts on second of October. Unit two. Lesson three, exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words, and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One, fat. Two, sat. Three, veal. Four, thought. Five, sees. Exercise two. Distinguishing liaisons, link linking. One. Go up the street and turn right. Two. Take the next left. Three. Time passes quickly when you enjoy yourself. Four. I'm going to buy something for the kitchen. Five. Then turn back up the street and turn right. Exercise three. Listen to the dialogue. And draw a map of the location of the classrooms: biology, chemistry, history. Excuse me, I'm new here. I'm looking for the biology lab. Go upstairs to the second floor, and it's the second one on the left. Great. Is the chemistry lab there too? No. That's on the third floor, the third one on the right. Thanks, Mrs. Brown's history class is on this floor, right? Yeah, I'm going there now. It's the last one on the left. Lesson four, exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words, and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One, peel. Two, batter. Three, bat. Four, set. Five, sail. Six, eel. Exercise two. Distinguishing liaisons, linking.
One. He taught us fifty new words. Two. We brought the plants. Three. I bought the books you wanted. Four. I need to wash something now. Five. This is the project. Which I'm working on now. Exercise three. Listen to the dialogue and draw a map of where the woman thinks the bookstore is. Excuse me. Is there a bookstore on this street? I don't think so. However, can you see the music store across the street? Yeah. Go along the street by that music store. There's a bookstore there. Is it on the left or right-hand side? I'm pretty sure it's on the left. Unit three. Lesson five. Exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to C. One. Wake. Two. Ride. Three, lies. Four, way. Five, lead. Six, wine. Seven, rock rock. Eight. White. Exercise two. Distinguishing liaisons, linking. One. We made a quick getaway. Two. Sean cooks well for a twelve-year-old. Three. To make sure he would not be too early, Jean-Paul walked slowly to the Estrada's house. Four. The candidate staff privately planned the re-election campaign. Five. His is a perfectly nice sweater. Jason doesn't need a new one. Exercise three. Listen to the dialogue and answer questions one to five. What are the sales figures like for two thousand and five? Well, there's been an overall increase of seventeen percent. That sounds okay. How about the different sectors? Stationery sales were up six point five percent. Equipment sales were up thirty point eight percent. That's great. Congratulations. And service sales rose by fifteen point two percent. We expect sales to rise by one sixth in two thousand and six. I think we should try to increase sales more than that. Any ideas? We could increase the marketing budget by a tenth.
Lesson six. Exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One. Wait. Two. Tower. Three. Beard. Four. Trains. Five. Crisp. Six. Sing. Seven. Accepted. Eight. Rot. Exercise two. Distinguishing liaisons, linking. One. The four tickets cost eight pounds. Two. My sister was born on the twenty-third of September, nineteen eighty-seven. Three. It's only a few hundred meters from here. Four. My bike is across the road. Five. The writer died in this very room. Exercise three. Listen to the dialogue and answer questions one to three. Where would the money come from? We need to spend less on the office expansion. How much less? About a fifth. Okay, I'll think about it. What were our total sales by country? We sold seventy point four five million dollars worth of products in the United States, and fourteen and a quarter million dollars worth outside the U.S. I haven't got the results for individual countries yet. Okay. I'll get those from you later. Unit four. Lesson seven. Part one. Exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to C. One. Lay. Two. Rice. Three. Lead. Four. Rain. Five. West. Six. Whale. Seven. Fat. Eight. Wine. Nine. Lee. Ten. Den. Exercise two. Listen to the sentences and write them on the lines below. One. His mother is bathing the baby. Two. Her father is soothing her brother.
Three. Don't bother to breathe under water. Four. Although he is a northerner, he is still my brother. Five. Sue's father soothes her when she is sick. Part two. Exercise one. Listen to conversations on the tape. Answer the following questions. Conversation A. Excuse me, where is Martin Luther King School? What? Where is Martin? Wait a minute. Let me turn off my engine now. Where is Martin Luther King School? Hmm. Go three roads. Is it three? No. Go four roads. Then turn right. Then go two roads. Wait. I have a map. Good. Show me Martin Luther King School. Look here. We are here. There's the school. I see. I go straight ahead, three roads. Then turn and go there. Turn right and go two roads. Martin Luther King School is there. Wonderful. Thank you. Conversation B. Goodbye, Mr. Lerner. Thank you very much for your time. Goodbye. Where is the airport? Oh, the airport. It's on Nixon Road. Where is Nixon Road? Turn left. Go straight ahead. Look for the sign. I have a map. Please show me. Oh, good. Look here. We are here. That's the school. I see. Now look there. That's the airport. Turn left. Go straight ahead. Then turn on Nixon Road. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Lesson eight. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. A fifteen-year-old boy was injured in a car accident when the minivan he was travelling in was hit by a pickup truck at an intersection. The boy was taken to a nearby hospital. The paramedics said that it appeared that the boy had nothing more serious than a broken left leg, but that internal injuries were always a possibility. The boy was conscious and alert. His mother, who was driving, was uninjured. She said that the truck appeared out of nowhere, and she thought she was going to die. She turned the steering wheel sharply to the left, and the truck hit her minivan on the passenger side. The driver of the truck was a fifty-year-old man who was unemployed and apparently had been drinking. Police found eighteen empty beer cans inside the truck. The man denied drinking, but he failed the police test for sobriety. When asked to touch his nose with his arms, outstretched and eyes closed, he was unable to touch any part of his head. The handcuffed man asked the police if they knew where Mabel was, as he was put into the back seat of the police vehicle. The police asked him if Mabel was his wife. He said. She's my dog, my dog. Where's my baby? A dog with a collar, but no identification, was found minutes later, half a block away. The man was taken to the city jail and booked on suspicion of driving while intoxicated, and on causing an accident.
Exercise two. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer w questions below. A fifteen-year-old boy was injured in a car accident when the minivan he was traveling in was hit by a pickup truck at an intersection. The boy was taken to a nearby hospital. The paramedic said that it appeared that the boy had nothing more serious than a broken left leg, but that internal injuries were always a possibility. The boy was conscious and alert. His mother, who was driving, was uninjured. She said that the truck appeared out of nowhere, and she thought she was going to die. She turned the steering wheel sharply to the left, and the truck hit her minivan on the passenger side. The driver of the truck was a fifty-year-old man who was unemployed and apparently had been drinking. Police found eighteen empty beer cans inside the truck. The man denied drinking, but he failed the police test for sobriety. When asked to touch his nose with his arms, outstretched and eyes closed, he was unable to touch any part of his head. The handcuffed man asked the police if they knew where Mabel was, as he was put into the back seat of the police vehicle. The police asked him if Mabel was his wife. He said. She's my dog, my dog. Where's my baby? A dog with a collar but no identification was found minutes later, half a block away. The man was taken to the city jail and booked on suspicion of driving while intoxicated, and on causing an accident. Unit Five. Lesson Nine. Part One. Exercise One. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to C. One. Places. Two. Bit. Three, palaces. Four, taught. Five, hated. Six, through. Seven, sleep. Sleep. Eight. Princess. Nine. Notes. Ten. Month. Exercise two. Listen to the sentences and write them on the lines below. One. Jim still steals Slim's jeans. Two. The heat wave hit the city. Three. I have seen many sinners. Four. Pete shipped the chips. Five. Jean loves to drink gin. Part two. Exercise one. Listen to the tape. Tick yes or no on the following statements. Okay. I'd like to start by asking you a few questions about yourself. Sure. What are you currently doing? Are you a worker or a student? 
I'm a student at Beijing Normal University. Right. And how long have you been studying for? I am going into my fourth year after this break, so I've been studying now for just about three full years. Hmm. And what do you study? I am studying to be a teacher. Specifically, I would like to be an English teacher. It's been my dream since I was in primary school. Okay. Tell me about a typical day for you as a student. What kinds of things do you do each day? Well, it varies, of course. But what I usually do is to attend classes in the morning. The first one starts around eight thirty, and then in the afternoon I'm required to do some student teaching. That is, I help out an actual teacher in one of the public schools. I usually get back in the late afternoon. And I try to find someone who will play a few games of ping pong or go swimming with me. Right. So, would you like to continue studying teaching when you go overseas? No, because the education program there is very different. But I will study English literature, because I hope I can return to China and teach university students how to enjoy the English classes. You know. Perhaps a university teaching job is not the greatest paying job, but it's a noble profession that can earn you a lot of respect. I hope my time in Australia can prepare me well. Thanks. And now, if I could just ask you a few questions about. Exercise two. Listen to the tape. Take the feedback the interviewer gives to the candidate. Okay. I'd like to start by asking you a few questions about yourself. Sure. What are you currently doing? Are you a worker or a student? I'm a student. At Beijing Normal University. Right. And how long have you been studying for? I am going into my fourth year after this break, so I've been studying now for just about three full years. Hmm. And what do you study? I am studying to be a teacher. Specifically, I would like to be an English teacher. It's been my dream since I was in primary school. Okay, tell me about a typical day for you as a student. What kinds of things do you do each day? Well, it varies, of course. But what I usually do is to attend classes in the morning. The first one starts around eight thirty, and then in the afternoon I'm required to do some student teaching. That is, I help out an actual teacher in one of the public schools. I usually get back in the late afternoon, and I try to find someone who will play a few games of ping pong or go swimming with me. Right. So, would you like to continue studying teaching when you go overseas? No, because the education program there is very different. But I will study English literature, because I hope I can return to China and teach university students how to enjoy the English classes. You know, perhaps a university teaching job is not the greatest paying job, but it's a noble profession that can earn you a lot of respect. I hope my time in Australia can prepare me well. Thanks. And now, if I could just ask you a few questions about. Exercise three. Listen to the tape and complete the following expressions. Okay. I'd like to start by asking you a few questions about yourself. Sure. What are you currently doing? Are you a worker or a student? I'm a student at Beijing Normal University. Right. And how long have you been studying for? 
I am going into my fourth year after this break, so I've been studying now for just about three full years. Hmm. And what do you study? I am studying to be a teacher. Specifically, I would like to be an English teacher. It's been my dream since I was in primary school. Okay. Tell me about a typical day for you as a student. What kinds of things do you do each day? Well, it varies, of course. But what I usually do is to attend classes in the morning. The first one starts around eight thirty, and then in the afternoon I'm required to do some student teaching. That is, I help out an actual teacher in one of the public schools. I usually get back in the late afternoon. And I try to find someone who will play a few games of ping pong or go swimming with me. Right. So, would you like to continue studying teaching when you go overseas? No, because the education program there is very different. But I will study English literature, because I hope I can return to China and teach university students how to enjoy the English classes. You know. Perhaps a university teaching job is not the greatest paying job, but it's a noble profession that can earn you a lot of respect. I hope my time in Australia can prepare me well. Thanks. And now, if I could just ask you a few questions about. Lesson ten. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. Jerry Baldwin was thirty years old. He was the manager of a pizza restaurant. He lived in an apartment about one mile north of the restaurant. He walked to and from work. When it was raining, he took the bus. Jerry loved gangster movies. When a new one came out, he would go to the theater and watch the new movie three or four times. Then, when it went to video, Jerry would buy the video at Barney's Video Store. Jerry had a home collection of over one thousand gangster videos. Old ones, new ones, color, black and white, English, Spanish, Japanese—he loved them all. He could tell you the name of the movie, the director, the stars, and the plot. Did you say you liked Pulp Fiction? Well, Jerry would rattle off all the details of that movie, and then he would invite you to his place to watch it sometime. He was a nice guy. Jerry finally decided that he would like to own a gun, just like the gangsters. So he saved his money for a couple of years. Then he went to a gun store and bought a used thirty-eight caliber revolver for three hundred dollars. While there, he also bought a couple of boxes of ammunition. The following Saturday morning, he went to the gun club to practice with his new revolver. He was in the club for only ten minutes when he accidentally dropped his pistol. The gun went off, and the bullet went into Jerry's right knee. Jerry now walks with a limp and a cane, just like some gangsters. Exercise two. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer what questions below. Jerry Baldwin was thirty years old. He was the manager of a pizza restaurant. He lived in an apartment about one mile north of the restaurant. He walked to and from work. When it was raining, he took the bus. Jerry loved gangster movies. When a new one came out, he would go to the theater and watch the new movie 
three or four times. Then, when it went to video, Jerry would buy the video at Barney's video store. Jerry had a home collection of over 1,000 gangster videos. Old ones, new ones, colour, black and white, English, Spanish, Japanese. He loved them all. He could tell you the name of the movie, the director, the stars and the plot. Did you say you liked Pulp Fiction? Well, Jerry would rattle off all the details of that movie. And then he would invite you to his place to watch it sometime. He was a nice guy. Jerry finally decided that he would like to own a gun, just like the gangsters. So he saved his money for a couple of years. Then he went to a gun store and bought a used thirty-eight caliber revolver for three hundred dollars. While there, he also bought a couple of boxes of ammunition. The following Saturday morning, he went to the gun club to practice with his new revolver. He was in the club for only ten minutes when he accidentally dropped his pistol. The gun went off and the bullet went into Jerry's right knee. Jerry now walks with a limp and a cane, just like some gangsters. Unit 6 Lesson 11 Part 1 Exercise 1 Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to C. One Healthy Two Skate Three Liked Four Washed Five Lead Six Pool Seven, seven Breeze Eight Boots Nine Sung Ten Sheep Exercise 2 Listen to the tape and write the sentences on the lines below. One Seashells on the seashore are sold in shops. Two Cheap ship chimes shine sometimes. Three Sean was ashamed of leasing his leash. Four. Sue's shoes were chewed by her chow chow. Five. Chop shop sop shoppers. Part two. Exercise one. Listen to the tape and complete the sentences below. Write no more than three words for each blank. So what else do you like doing in your spare time? Do you enjoy playing or watching sports? Yeah, I love playing tennis. I don't mean just table tennis, I mean actual tennis. I see. Do you usually play with the same people? Or different people. My tennis partner is my husband, but I am frankly much better, so I try to find people who can challenge me more. Right. 
Why do you like tennis so much? It's a good combination of strategy and fast action. You can't just belt the ball in any way. You have to think of the dynamics of ball speed. I see. Is tennis popular in your country? Yes, it's getting more popular. You know they say tennis is a rich man's sport, but it's now becoming a lot more available in many places. You see, table tennis is so widespread because you can set up a table anywhere, and most of the state-owned companies have a room where you can play when you aren't busy. But tennis takes more space. Thanks. That's the end of the interview. Exercise two. Listen to the tape again. Number the parts of the sentences in the correct order that they are spoken. Then write the sentences in the correct order in the space below. So, what else do you like doing in your spare time? Do you enjoy playing or watching sports? Yeah. I love playing tennis. I don't mean just table tennis. I mean actual tennis. I see. Do you usually play with the same people or different people? My tennis partner is my husband, but I am frankly much better. So I try to find people who can challenge me more. Right. Why do you like tennis so much? It's a good combination of strategy and fast action. You can't just belt the ball in any way. You have to think of the dynamics of ball speed. I see. Is tennis popular in your country? Yes, it's getting more popular. You know they say tennis is a rich man's sport, but it's now becoming a lot more available in many places. But let's face it, you need to have good tennis schools and coaches, and China doesn't have that yet. You see, table tennis is so widespread because you can set up a table anywhere, and most of the state-owned companies have a room where you can play when you aren't busy. But tennis takes more space. Thanks. That's the end of the interview. Lesson twelve. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. A twenty-four-year-old Los Angeles man was taken to a hospital and then to county jail after leading police on a one-hour freeway chase in a stolen SUV. The chase ended in downtown Los Angeles, in front of the Spring Hotel. Most of the chase was uneventful, except for an empty bottle of whiskey that the driver threw at one police vehicle. When the driver got into downtown, things started to happen. He ran over a fire hydrant. The water spewed out of the hydrant, causing a geyser that ruined all the books in several carts that a vendor had put outside. To attract customers into his bookstore, the driver hurriedly turned west onto Grand Avenue and managed to bang into three parked cars on one side of that street and two cars on the other side. The driver also tried to run over a police officer who was standing in the crosswalk, ordering him to halt. Turning north, the driver caused a bus to slam on its brakes to avoid a collision. The bus was empty. And the bus driver was uninjured. However, two police cars that were pursuing the SUV from different directions were not so lucky. One of them ran into the front of the bus, and the other into the back. Because the drivers had braked early enough, the damage to their cars was minor. Both officers resumed the chase. They only went two blocks north to find that the SUV had come to a full stop. Because it had ploughed into a newspaper stand, 
The driver, who was not wearing a seatbelt, was slumped behind the steering wheel. The proprietor of the newsstand was yelling at the driver and shaking a magazine at him. The police called for the ambulance. They charged the driver with failure to yield to a police officer and driving under the influence. Exercise 2. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer W questions below. A 24 year old Los Angeles man was taken to a hospital and then to county jail after leading police on a one hour freeway chase in a stolen SUV. The chase ended in downtown Los Angeles, in front of the Spring Hotel. Most of the chase was uneventful, except for an empty bottle of whiskey that the driver threw at one police vehicle. When the driver got into downtown, things started to happen. He ran over a fire hydrant. The water spewed out of the hydrant, causing a geezer that ruined all the books in several carts that a vendor had put outside to attract customers into his bookstore. The driver hurriedly turned west onto Grand Avenue and managed to bang into three parked cars on one side of that street and two cars on the other side. The driver also tried to run over a police officer who was standing in the crosswalk ordering him to halt. Turning north, the driver caused a bus to slam on its brakes to avoid a collision. The bus was empty and the bus driver was uninjured. However, two police cars that were pursuing the SUV from different directions were not so lucky. One of them ran into the front of the bus and the other into the back. Because the drivers had braked early enough, the damage to their cars was minor. Both officers resumed the chase. They only went two blocks north to find that the SUV had come to a full stop because it had ploughed into a newspaper stand. The driver, who was not wearing a seatbelt, was slumped behind the steering wheel. The proprietor of the newsstand was yelling at the driver and shaking a magazine at him. The police called for the ambulance. They charged the driver with failure to yield to a police officer and driving under the influence. Unit 7 Lesson 13 Part 1 Exercise 1 Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to C. 1. Slip 2. Cap Three, thirteen. Four, cloth. Five, meant. Six, eat. S seven, walked. Eight. Taught. Nine. Nice. Ten. Wash. Exercise two. Listen to the sentences and write them on the lines below. One. Would you like to walk in the woods? Two. Fine wine grows on fine vines. Three. Wheels on whales would wind up downwind. Four. 
before. Wool and wood are wonderful words to pronounce. Five. Wandering wolves in the woods are weird. Part two. Exercise one. Listen to the tape. Tick yes or no on the following statements. What's the main food of China? I would say that most people might consider rice as their staple food, but this is different in different parts of China. For example, people in the north perhaps eat more noodles and buns than in the south. Has the diet or food that people eat in China been changing in the last thirty or forty years, or is it pretty much the same? No. Like with almost everything else, we are also beginning to change our diet, not in any major way, but gradually. And most changes are especially prevalent among the younger people. What are some of those changes? Well, the first big change is in the spread of food from other parts of the world. Perhaps you know that China is going through a fast food craze now. There are fast food restaurants everywhere in the bigger cities. It seems. The second biggest change is that the snack foods that people used to typically sell outdoors are now being seen in more specialized restaurants that cater to younger crowds. At home, you are finding people starting to cook dishes that were once thought to be luxury dishes, and people are not eating such simple rice and vegetable dishes as they once did. This is just another sign of growing prosperity. Have you changed your diet over the years? Not really, because I have always preferred to eat colder dishes with lots of vegetables. You see, I am not that keen on the art of eating. I just eat because I have to keep my body functioning. But I really don't care that much about what I eat, as long as it doesn't have too much oil, and as long as it is relatively fresh. Can you briefly tell me? How you think Chinese food is different from that of other countries? Well, without knowing too much about the kinds of dishes other people like to eat, I've heard that while Chinese cooking relies more on the stir-fry technique for its vegetables, other countries like big pieces of it, as they do in places like Australia. I mean, I don't mind a hamburger, but to eat such a big cut of meat and then having to cut it all up anyway. Seems like a waste of time, and I also don't really like broiled or baked food. Exercise two. Listen to the tape and tick the words that speaker A and speaker B say. What's the main food of China? I would say that most people might consider rice as their staple food, but this is different in different parts of China. For example, people in the north perhaps eat more noodles and buns than in the south. Has the diet or food that people eat in China been changing in the last thirty or forty years, or is it pretty much the same? No. Like with almost everything else, we are also beginning to change our diet, not in any major way, but gradually. And most changes are especially prevalent among the younger people. What are some of those changes? Well, the first big change is in the spread of food from other parts of the world. Perhaps you know that China is going through a fast food craze now. There are fast food restaurants everywhere in the bigger cities. It seems. The second biggest change is that the snack foods that people used to typically sell outdoors are now being seen in more specialized restaurants that cater to younger crowds. At home, you are finding people starting to cook dishes that were once thought to be luxury dishes, and people are not eating such simple rice and vegetable dishes as they once did. 
This is just another sign of growing prosperity. Have you changed your diet over the years? Not really, because I have always preferred to eat colder dishes with lots of vegetables. You see, I am not that keen on the art of eating. I just eat because I have to keep my body functioning. But I really don't care that much about what I eat, as long as it doesn't have too much oil, and as long as it is relatively fresh. Can you briefly tell me how you think Chinese food is different from that of other countries? Well, without knowing too much about the kinds of dishes other people like to eat, I've heard that while Chinese cooking relies more on the stir-fry technique for its vegetables, other countries like big pieces of it, as they do in places like Australia. I mean, I don't mind a hamburger, but to eat such a big cut of meat. And then having to cut it all up anyway seems like a waste of time. And I also don't really like broiled or baked food. Lesson fourteen. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. Sam, an unemployed piano tuner, said it was only the second thing he had ever won in his life. The first thing was an Afghan blanket at a church raffle when he was twenty-five years old, but this was much bigger. It was a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. He had won the big cube, a state lottery game. To win, a contestant must first guess which number a spinning cube will stop on. The cube has six numbers on it: one times, ten times, fifty times, a hundred times, five hundred times, and one thousand times. If he is correct, the contestant must then guess which of two selected variables is going to be greater. So, just guessing which number appears on the cube does not guarantee that you will win any money. Sam correctly guessed a thousand times, but he still had to choose between two variables. One variable was the number of cars that would run the stop sign at Hill Street. And Lake Avenue in six hours. The other variable was the number of times that a teenage boy would change TV channels in a three-hour period. This was a tough decision. Finally, Sam flipped a coin. It came up heads, so Sam picked the teenager. He picked right. The stop sign was run only seventy-six times. But the teen clicked a hundred and twenty times. Sixty-year-old Sam jumped for joy, for he had just won a thousand times a hundred and twenty, or a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Sam dreamily left the lottery studio, talking excitedly on his cell phone while crossing the street. He got hit by a little sports car. Sam is slowly getting better. He was in the hospital for a month. His hospital bill was a hundred and ten thousand dollars, and the insurance company for the little sports car's owner sued Sam for nine thousand dollars worth of repairs. Also, Sam still has to pay federal taxes on his winnings. Sam doesn't play the state lottery any more. He says it's better to be unlucky. Exercise two. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer what questions below. Sam, an unemployed piano tuner, said it was only the second thing he had ever won in his life. The first thing was an Afghan blanket at a church raffle when he was twenty-five years old. 
But this was much bigger. It was a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. He had won the big cube, a state lottery game. To win, a contestant must first guess which number a spinning cube will stop on. The cube has six numbers on it: one times, ten times, fifty times, a hundred times, five hundred times, and one thousand times. If he is correct, the contestant must then guess which of two selected variables is going to be greater. So, just guessing which number appears on the cube does not guarantee that you will win any money. Sam correctly guessed a thousand times, but he still had to choose between two variables. One variable was the number of cars that would run the stop sign at Hill Street and Lake Avenue in six hours. The other variable was the number of times that a teenage boy would change TV channels in a three-hour period. This was a tough decision. Finally, Sam flipped a coin. It came up heads, so Sam picked the teenager. He picked right. The stop sign was run only seventy-six times, but the teen clicked a hundred and twenty times. Sixty-year-old Sam jumped for joy, for he had just won a thousand times a hundred and twenty, or a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Sam dreamily left the lottery studio, talking excitedly on his cell phone while crossing the street. He got hit by a little sports car. Sam is slowly getting better. He was in the hospital for a month. His hospital bill was a hundred and ten thousand dollars, and the insurance company for the little sports car's owner sued Sam for nine thousand dollars worth of repairs. Also, Sam still has to pay federal taxes on his winnings. Sam doesn't play the state lottery any more. He says it's better to be unlucky. Unit Eight. Lesson Fifteen. Part One. Exercise One. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to C. One. Back. Two. Main. Three. Card. Four, chose. Five, new. Six, paste. Seven, then, port. Eight, sixty. Nine. Watched. Ten. Liked. Exercise two. Listen to the sentences and write them on the lines below. One. It's sad what Ed's ad said. Two. Kent can't dance because he's dense. Three. I guess the gas lacks lead. Four. Brad's bread was a bland brand. Five. But Betty's bet was on the batter.
Part two. Exercise one. Listen to the tape. Complete the notes. Write no more than three words for each answer. Right. I'd just like to ask you a few questions about your family. Do you have a large or a small family? It's small. It only consists of my parents and me. You know, in China we have the one-child policy, so I have no brothers or sisters. My parents are both working in the same place, an engineering company, and they are doing very similar work, although they are not working together on projects. What are the advantages of having a small family as compared to a large family? Well, I'm just guessing, but I imagine a large family allows you to be more socially astute, since you have to communicate with others and you sort of learn from the experience of your siblings. I think you are also under pressure not to act out of line more when you have older brothers and sisters, because they may give you trouble. As an only child, I only have to worry about pleasing my parents. What do you and your parents like to do when you are all together? Well, I'd like to tell you that we are all involved in games and picnics, but I'm afraid that's not the case. Basically, we turn on the TV and watch together. At dinner, we do talk about a lot of different topics, and I often help to do the cleaning around the house. On the weekends. We tend to do our own things, but once in a while we'll get together and do some shopping. Exercise two. Listen to the tape again. Match the questions and statements with the correct responses. Right. I'd just like to ask you a few questions about your family. Do you have a large or a small family? It's small. It only consists of my parents and me. You know, in China we have the one-child policy, so I have no brothers or sisters. My parents are both working in the same place, an engineering company, and they are doing very similar work, although. They are not working together on projects. What are the advantages of having a small family as compared to a large family? Well, I'm just guessing, but I imagine a large family allows you to be more socially astute, since you have to communicate with others and you sort of learn from the experience of your siblings. I think you are also under pressure not to act out of line more. When you have older brothers and sisters, because they may give you trouble. As an only child, I only have to worry about pleasing my parents. What do you and your parents like to do when you are all together? Well, I'd like to tell you that we are all involved in games and picnics, but I'm afraid that's not the case. Basically, we turn on the TV and watch together. At dinner. We do talk about a lot of different topics, and I often help to do the cleaning around the house. On the weekends, we tend to do our own things, but once in a while we'll get together and do some shopping. Lesson sixteen. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. Inmates released two correctional officers they had held for a week in the tower at the state prison complex. The inmates captured the officers a week ago after the two officers tried to quell a food fight in the main dining room. The food fight erupted. When the prisoners discovered that their candy ration had been cut in half, the candy is a popular bartering item. Inmates trade it for cigarettes, cigars, magazines, stationery, legal dictionaries, and other items. 
Prison officials said it was necessary to cut back on this luxury item in order to provide basic items like soap and razors and toilet paper. The prisoners went berserk over the reduction. They threw food, plates, and silverware at the doors, windows, and guards. Then they grabbed two guards and hauled them up to the tower. Once they had the tower door secured, they sent messages to prison officials demanding big bags of candy in exchange for sparing the guards' lives. The warden complied with their demands. After a week of negotiations, the prisoners approved a deal which restored their candy ration. But in return, the administration said they would have to reduce daily soap allotments by 75%. Exercise 2. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer w questions below. Inmates released two correctional officers they had held for a week in the tower at the state prison complex. The inmates captured the officers a week ago. After the two officers tried to quell a food fight in the main dining room, the food fight erupted when the prisoners discovered that their candy ration had been cut in half. The candy is a popular bartering item. Inmates trade it for cigarettes, cigars, magazines, stationery, legal dictionaries, and other items. Prison officials said it was necessary to cut back on this luxury item. In order to provide basic items like soap and razors and toilet paper, the prisoners went berserk over the reduction. They threw food, plates, and silverware at the doors, windows, and guards. Then they grabbed two guards and hauled them up to the tower. Once they had the tower door secured, they sent messages to prison officials demanding big bags of candy in exchange for sparing the guards' lives. The warden complied with their demands. After a week of negotiations, the prisoners approved a deal which restored their candy ration. But in return, the administration said they would have to reduce daily soap allotments by seventy-five percent. Exercise three. Dictation. One. Inmates release two correctional officers. Two. The officers were held for a week in the tower. Three. The two officers tried to quell a food fight. Four. The candy ration had been cut in half. Five. Candy is a popular bartering item. Six. Inmates trade candy for cigarettes and other items. Seven. It was necessary to cut back on this luxury item. Eight. The prisoners went berserk over the reduction. Nine. 
They threw silverware at the guards. Ten. They sent messages to prison officials. Unit nine. Lesson seventeen. Part one. Exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word. That is read on the tape from A to C. One. Drew. Two. Walk. Three. Work. Four. Slipped. Five. Throne. Six. Pens. Seven. Sixteenth. Eight. Shut. Nine. Breeze. Ten. Expansive. Part two. Exercise one. Listen to the tape and complete the note using no more than three words for each blank. Okay. I'd now like to ask you a few questions about what you do. What is your current occupation? Do you work or study? I'm working for a computer web designing company. It's a fairly large local company in Shanghai, specialising in websites for joint venture and wholly owned foreign enterprises. Most of our clients are from Shanghai, but we also get a lot of clients from Shenzhen. And a few from Beijing. Uh huh. And what are some of your responsibilities? Tell me about a typical day at work. Have you ever designed a website? Because if you have, you probably know that the hardest part is just thinking about what can be done. Well, what I have to do is give the basic instructions to the junior staff about what I basically want to see in the web design, and so. I have to ensure the job is done right, so I guess you can say I'm in charge of the planning, but I do not do any of the actual manual work of programming. So most of the day I'm either writing up plans, communicating them to the staff, or checking through what they have done. What are some of the things you like about your work? Well, it is creative and interesting, and there is always a way to do it better. The best thing about my work. Is that it generally pleases the people when it is done well, so you can get immediate feedback. Also, to be frank, the pay is pretty good. I mean, you work hard, but your salary at the end of the month is a lot better than what a lot of others are making. That sounds very exciting. Are there any things about your job that you don't like so much? Well, do people in the computer field ever go home on time? Not often. The hours are long and the deadlines are quite tight, because often customers have no concept about how much actual labour is involved. They say they need it by a certain date, and will tell us directly that if we can't get it done, they will go to our competitors. So it's not unusual for me to be working until midnight in my office, which my family doesn't exactly like too much. Good. Now can I ask you just a few questions about? Exercise two. Listen to the tape again and circle the correct answer. Okay, 
I'd now like to ask you a few questions about what you do. What is your current occupation? Do you work or study? I'm working for a computer web designing company. It's a fairly large local company in Shanghai, specializing in websites for joint venture and wholly owned foreign enterprises. Most of our clients are from Shanghai, but we also get a lot of clients from Shenzhen and a few from Beijing. Uh huh. And what are some of your responsibilities? Tell me about a typical day at work. Have you ever designed a website? Because if you have, you probably know that the hardest part is just thinking about what can be done. Well, what I have to do is give the basic instructions to the junior staff about what I basically want to see in the web design, and so I have to ensure the job is done right. So I guess you can say I'm in charge of the planning. But I do not do any of the actual manual work of programming, so most of the day I'm either writing up plans, communicating them to the staff, or checking through what they have done. What are some of the things you like about your work? Well, it is creative and interesting, and there is always a way to do it better. The best thing about my work is that it generally pleases the people when it is done well, so you can get immediate feedback. Also, to be frank, the pay is pretty good. I mean, you work hard, but your salary at the end of the month is a lot better than what a lot of others are making. That sounds very exciting. Are there any things about your job that you don't like so much? Well, do people in the computer field ever go home on time? Not often. The hours are long and the deadlines are quite tight. Because often customers have no concept about how much actual labour is involved, they say they need it by a certain date, and will tell us directly that if we can't get it done, they will go to our competitors. So it's not unusual for me to be working until midnight in my office, which my family doesn't exactly like too much. Good. Now can I ask you just a few questions about? Lesson eighteen. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. Two mayors made a bet on the outcome of the vegetable bowl, the annual football game between their high school teams. If Arvada's team lost. The mayor of Arvada would send the mayor of Boulder ten pounds of sliced potatoes ready for frying. If Boulder's team lost, the mayor would send ten pounds of sliced tomatoes ready for sandwiches or salads. Unfortunately, before the game started, the mayor of Boulder overheard the Arvada mayor tell someone, "They grow the worst tomatoes." If they lose and send us their tomatoes, I'm going to give them all to my pig. The mayor of Boulder was upset to hear this, because he thought Boulder's tomatoes were the best in the state. So he gave the matter some thought. The following week, the big game was played. Boulder lost its star quarterback in the first half when he tripped over a cheerleader and sprained his big toe. The quarterback glumly watched the rest of the game from the bench. His team ended up losing, thirty-eight to twelve. The two mayors shook hands after the game, and the Arvada mayor said, "I'm really looking forward to those tomatoes." As the Boulder team left the stadium, some unhappy fans threw ripe tomatoes at them. A week later. The mayor of Arvada received a package of beautifully sliced tomatoes. He took them straight to his pig, which gobbled them right up. That night, the mayor of Boulder asked his wife if Arvada's mayor had called. "No," she said. "Why?" "Because I mixed a pint of hot sauce into the tomatoes, and I wanted to know how his pig's doing."
Exercise 2. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer w questions below. Two mares made a bet on the outcome of the Vegetable Bowl, the annual football game between their high school teams. If Arvada's team lost, the mayor of Arvada would send mayor of Boulder ten pounds of sliced potatoes ready for frying. If Boulder's team lost, the mayor would send ten pounds of sliced tomatoes ready for sandwiches or salads. Unfortunately, before the game started, the mayor of Boulder overheard the Arvada mayor tell someone, they grow the worst tomatoes. If they lose and send us their tomatoes, I'm going to give them all to my pig. The mayor of Boulder was upset to hear this, because he thought Boulder's tomatoes were the best in the state. So he gave the matter some thought. The following week, the big game was played. Boulder lost its star quarterback in the first half when he tripped over a cheerleader and sprained his big toe. The quarterback glumly watched the rest of the game from the bench. His team ended up losing, 38 to 12. The two mares shook hands after the game, and the Arvada mare said, I'm really looking forward to those tomatoes. As the Boulder team left the stadium, some unhappy fans threw ripe tomatoes at them. A week later, the mayor of Arvada received a package of beautifully sliced tomatoes. He took them straight to his pig, which gobbled them right up. That night, the mayor of Boulder asked his wife if Arvada's mayor had called. No, she said. Why? Because I mixed a pint of hot sauce into the tomatoes, and I wanted to know how his pig's doing. Exercise 3 Dictation One Two mares made a bet. Two A bet on the outcome of the vegetable bowl. Three. The annual football game was between their high school teams. Four. The mayor would send ten pounds of sliced tomatoes. Five. They grow the worst tomatoes. Six. The big game was played the following week. Seven. The quarterback tripped over a cheerleader. Eight. He watched the rest of the game from the bench. Nine. His team ended up losing 38 to 12. 10. I mixed a pint of hot sauce into the tomatoes. 
Unit Ten, Lesson Nineteen, Part One, Exercise One. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to C. One, lose. Two, vast. Three, addition. Four, boss. Five, fate. Six, pot. Seven, seven, books. Eight. Finally. Nine. Sense. Ten. Meat. Exercise two. Listen to the sentences and write them on the lines below. One, he can tell. Two, he can't tell. Three, it's four to two. Four, it's four to two. Five. He saw each and every time. Six. He saw each one every time. Part two. Exercise one. Listen to the tape. Number the parts of the sentences in the correct order that they are spoken. Then write the sentences in the correct order in the space below. Right now, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your free time. How often do you go travelling in your spare time? Well, I'm just a student, so it's a bit tough since now my main preoccupation. Is to try and finish my studies without adding too much to my family's financial burden, but I do go travelling about twice a year. What kinds of places do you like travelling to? I prefer remote places like Tibet and Xinjiang. There is more power in these places, and there are things you can see that you know you wouldn't see in any other place. How do you like travelling? Do you like travelling by yourself? Or with tour groups. By myself, I can't stand tours. First, they are designed to discover nothing new. Everything is done according to a preset plan, and the tour guides really are not that interested in the things they show you because they have seen them a million times before. The next reason I hate tours is they only want you to waste your money, and they don't mind taking you into gift shops all day if it means that they collect a commission. And then having to wander around places according to their plan is so annoying. What's your favourite means of getting around when you travel? You mean transportation? My favourites are my own two feet or a bicycle. If I can, I'll avoid the rest of them. But obviously, you have to make use of whatever transport you need. Trains, buses, and planes can all be uncomfortable. Depending on what circumstances you find yourself in when travelling, obviously I'll choose the cheapest way I can find to travel, but not to the extent that I am uncomfortably jammed into some overcrowded bus just to save a few RMB. What do you think of the tourism industry in China? Has it been changing? Yes, it's been getting a bit more specialised for different kinds of tourists. You see, they used to find about ten to twenty years ago. 
The tall tourists just wanted to travel on tour with some pleasant person who would recite all the facts on a loudspeaker, and then get paraded off to gift shops, lavish restaurants, and four or five star hotels. But actually, now we are finding more opportunities with backpacker crowds, who like going into more adventurous places and don't mind staying in more rustic places. As long as they're interesting and comfortable, we are now catering more to independent-style travellers, and that is good, I think. Exercise two. Listen to the tape again. Number these words in the order you hear them. Right now, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your free time. How often do you go travelling in your spare time? Well, I'm just a student, so it's a bit tough since now my main preoccupation is to try and finish my studies without adding too much to my family's financial burden. But I do go travelling about twice a year. What kinds of places do you like travelling to? I prefer remote places like Tibet and Xinjiang. There is more power in these places, and there are things you can see that you know you wouldn't see in any other place. How do you like travelling? Do you like travelling by yourself or with tour groups? By myself, I can't stand tours. First, they are designed to discover nothing new. Everything is done according to a preset plan. And the tour guides really are not that interested in the things they show you, because they have seen them a million times before. The next reason I hate tours is that they only want you to waste your money, and they don't mind taking you into gift shops all day if it means that they collect a commission. And then having to wander around places according to their plan is so annoying. What's your favourite means of getting around when you travel? You mean transportation? My favourites are my own two feet or a bicycle. If I can, I'll avoid the rest of them. But obviously, you have to make use of whatever transport you need. Trains, buses, and planes can all be uncomfortable, depending on what circumstances you find yourself in when travelling. Obviously, I'll choose the cheapest way I can find to travel, but not to the extent that I am uncomfortably jammed into some overcrowded bus just to save a few RMB. What do you think of the tourism industry in China? Has it been changing? Yes, it's been getting a bit more specialized for different kinds of tourists. You see, they used to find about ten to twenty years ago that all tourists just wanted to travel on tour with a pleasant person who would recite all the facts on a loudspeaker, and then get paraded off to gift shops, lavish restaurants, and four or five star hotels. But actually. Now we are finding more opportunities with backpacker crowds, who like going into more adventurous places and don't mind staying in more rustic places, as long as they're interesting and comfortable. We are now catering more to independent-style travellers, and that is good, I think. Lesson twenty. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. Goats are being hired to do the work of men in a neighborhood just outside of San Diego. The fires that occurred in Hillborough four years ago destroyed thirty homes. Most of which have been rebuilt. While contractors were rebuilding the homes, nature was regrowing the grasses, bushes, and shrubs. The area is now so overgrown in brush that it again poses a major fire hazard. The city council asked for bids to remove the brush. The lowest bid they received was fifty thousand dollars, and that was if the city provided breakfast and lunch for the work crews. For the six weeks it would take to clear the overgrown area, the city countered, offering unlimited coffee, black only, 
and a donut a day for each crew member. When that offer was rejected, the city asked for help on its website. A sheep herder in Montana and a goat herder in San Bernardino read about the city's plight while surfing the web on their laptops. They both offered to do the job for twenty-five thousand dollars. The council chose the goat herder because he lived closer. When told that the city dump was overflowing, the goat herder said, "No problem. My goats will eat everything in your dump, except for the automobile engines, of course." So, for another five thousand dollars, the city killed two birds with one stone. If all goes well, they will invite the goat herder and his family back every three years. The goat herder said he will probably visit San Diego while his goats are in the dump. I want to take one of those hang glider rides. I just hope we don't crash. My goats would miss me a lot, he said. Exercise two. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer what questions below. Goats are being hired to do the work of men in a neighborhood just outside of San Diego. The fires that occurred in Hillborough four years ago destroyed thirty homes, most of which have been rebuilt. While contractors were rebuilding the homes, nature was regrowing the grasses, bushes, and shrubs. The area is now so overgrown in brush that it again poses a major fire hazard. The city council asked for bids to remove the brush. The lowest bid they received was fifty thousand dollars, and that was if the city provided breakfast and lunch for the work crews for the six weeks it would take to clear the overgrown area. The city countered, offering unlimited coffee, black only, and a donut a day for each crew member. When that offer was rejected, the city asked for help on its website. A sheep herder in Montana and a goat herder in San Bernardino read about the city's plight while surfing the web on their laptops. They both offered to do the job for twenty-five thousand dollars. The council chose the goat herder because he lived closer. When told that the city dump was overflowing, the goat herder said, "No problem. My goats will eat everything in your dump, except for the automobile engines, of course." So, for another five thousand dollars, the city killed two birds with one stone. If all goes well, they will invite the goat herder and his family back every three years. The goat herder said he will probably visit San Diego while his goats are in the dump. I want to take one of those hang glider rides. I just hope we don't crash. My goats would miss me a lot, he said. Exercise three. Dictation. One. Goats are being hired to do the work of men. Two. The fires destroyed thirty homes four years ago. Three. Most of the homes have been rebuilt. Four. The area is now overgrown in brush. Five. The city council asked for bids to remove the brush. Six. 
the lowest bid they received was $50,000. 7. The city provided breakfast and lunch for the work crews. Eight. The city offered unlimited coffee and a donut. Nine. That offer was rejected. Ten. They were surfing the web on their laptops. 11. Lesson 21. Part 1. Exercise 1. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to C. One. Pet. Two. Sin. Three. Boots. Four. Fifty. Five. West. Six. Shot. Seven and cab. Eight. Beaten. Nine. Hats. Ten. Dove. Exercise two. Listen to the sentences and write them on the lines below. One. Those are certainly weird words. Two. Car care is very nearly necessary in today's world. Three. Barry buried his stories. Four. A burning barn is sort of horrifying. Five. Birds were turning over her fair hair. Part 2. Exercise 1. Listen to the tape. Complete the summary. Write no more than three words for each blank. I was trying to think of my best day. You know, my life at school seems so long ago. I can remember an occasion when I won first prize in a singing contest and I think that had to have been my best day at school. The competition was held outside the school, and we had a stage set up for each of us to sing. The sound quality was not very good, since it was an outdoor competition, but I suppose that might have acted in my favour, since I really don't think I am that good of a singer. But anyway, I can remember feeling on stage as nervous as anything, and just closing my eyes and letting myself sort of float in my imagination. I imagined this was my profession, and I thought of myself as a famous person, but I can't remember who it was. It was so long ago. Anyway, after the song was finished, I remember people were giving me quite a good applause. 
When my name was announced as the winner, I felt like flying again. You know, it was something that meant so much to me just to be on stage, but to actually also land the first prize was something else. Now that I think back, however, I probably won more because I had good relations with the judges. They were all teachers who quite liked me, but anyway, I won't forget the feeling. I consider it as my best day because it was the first time I had ever won something, and from that day on, I really believed I could be the top at anything if I tried hard, and even my grades started to improve after that competition. Exercise two. Listen to the tape again and complete the summary. Use the words from the box. There are more words in the box than you need. Some words may be used more than once. I was trying to think of my best day. You know, my life at school seems so long ago. I can remember an occasion when I won first prize in a singing contest, and I think that had to have been my best day at school. The competition was held outside the school, and we had a stage set up for each of us to sing. The sound quality was not very good, since it was an outdoor competition, but I suppose that might have acted in my favour, since I really don't think I am that good of a singer. But anyway, I can remember feeling on stage as nervous as anything, and just closing my eyes and letting myself sort of float in my imagination. I imagined this was my profession, and I thought of myself as a famous person, but I can't remember who it was. It was so long ago. Anyway, after the song was finished, I remember people were giving me quite a good applause. When my name was announced as the winner, I felt like flying again. You know, it was something that meant so much to me just to be on stage, but to actually also land the first prize was something else. Now that I think back, however, I probably won more because I had good relations with the judges. They were all teachers who quite liked me, but anyway, I won't forget the feeling. I consider it as my best day, because it was the first time I had ever won something, and from that day on, I really believed I could be the top at anything if I tried hard, and even my grades started to improve after that competition. Lesson twenty two. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. The owner of a missing cat is asking for help. My baby has been missing for over a month now, and I want him back so badly," said Mrs. Brown, a fifty-six-year-old woman. Mrs. Brown lives by herself in a trailer park near Clovis. She said that Clyde, her seven-year-old cat, didn't come home for dinner more than a month ago. The next morning, he didn't appear for breakfast either. After Clyde missed an extra special lunch, she called the police. When the policeman asked her to describe Clyde, she told him that Clyde had beautiful green eyes, had all his teeth, but was missing half of his left ear. And was seven years old and completely white. She then told the officer that Clyde was about a foot high. A bell went off. "Is Clyde your child or your pet?" the officer suspiciously asked. "Well, he's my cat, of course," Mrs. Brown replied. "Lady, you're supposed to report missing persons, not missing cats," said the irritated policeman. "Well." Who can I report this to? She asked. You can't. You have to ask around your neighbourhood or put up flyers, replied the officer. 
Mrs. Brown figured that a billboard would work a lot better than an 8 inch by 11 inch piece of paper on a telephone pole. There was an empty billboard at the end of her street, just off the interstate highway. The billboard had a phone number on it. She called that number and they told her they could blow up a picture of Clyde from Mrs. Brown's family album and put it on the billboard for all to see. But how can people see it when they whiz by on the interstate? she asked. Oh, don't worry, madam. They only whiz by between 2am and 5.30am. The rest of the day, the interstate is so full of commuters that no one moves. They told her it would cost only $3,000 a month, so she took most of the money out of her savings account and rented the billboard for a month. The month has passed, but Clyde has not appeared. Because she has almost no money in savings, Mrs. Brown called the local newspaper to see if anyone could help her rent the billboard for just one more month. She is waiting, but, so far, no one has stepped forward. Exercise 2 Listen to a story on the tape. Answer what questions below. The owner of a missing cat is asking for help. My baby has been missing for over a month now and I want him back so badly, said Mrs. Brown, a 56-year-old woman. Mrs. Brown lives by herself in a trailer park near Clovis. She said that Clyde, her seven-year-old cat, didn't come home for dinner more than a month ago. The next morning, he didn't appear for breakfast either. After Clyde missed an extra special lunch, she called the police. When the policeman asked her to describe Clyde, she told him that Clyde had beautiful green eyes, had all his teeth but was missing half of his left ear, and was seven years old and completely white. She then told the officer that Clyde was about a foot high. A bell went off. Is Clyde your child or your pet? The officer suspiciously asked. Well, he's my cat, of course, Mrs. Brown replied. Lady, you're supposed to report missing persons, not missing cats, said the irritated policeman. Well, who can I report this to? she asked. You can't. You have to ask around your neighbourhood or put up flyers, replied the officer. Mrs. Brown figured that a billboard would work a lot better than an 8 inch by 11 inch piece of paper on a telephone pole. There was an empty billboard at the end of her street, just off the interstate highway. The billboard had a phone number on it. She called that number and they told her they could blow up a picture of Clyde from Mrs. Brown's family album and put it on the billboard for all to see. But how can people see it when they whiz by on the interstate? she asked. Oh, don't worry, madam. They only whiz by between 2am and 5.30am. The rest of the day, the interstate is so full of commuters that no one moves. They told her it would cost only $3,000 a month, so she took most of the money out of her savings account and rented the billboard for a month. The month has passed, but Clyde has not appeared. Because she has almost no money in savings, Mrs. Brown called the local newspaper to see if anyone could help her rent the billboard for just one more month. She is waiting, but, so far, no one has stepped forward. Exercise 3 Dictation One. The owner of a missing cat is asking for help. Two. She lives by herself in a trailer park. Three. 
Her cat didn't come home for dinner. Four. Mrs. Brown told him that Clyde had beautiful green eyes. Five. He didn't appear for breakfast either. Six. There was an empty billboard at the end of Mrs. Brown's street. Seven. They told her they could blow up a picture. Eight. The interstate is so full of commuters that no one moves. Nine. She took most of the money out of her savings account. Ten. She called the local newspaper to see if anyone could help. Unit twelve, lesson twenty three. Part one, exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the right answer by selecting the capital letter. One, conversation. Two, pence. Three, mine. Four, grass. Five, persecution. Six, text. Seven, tight. Eight. Two minibuses. Nine. Ballet. Ten. Eating. Exercise two. You will hear the sentences below, but only one of the italicized words will be spoken. Circle the one word which you hear. One. Geoffrey saw the path and took it. Two. Thora and Thelma read all about the trees. Three. After the rain, his boots were covered with mud. Four. All the students saw the three men and applauded. Five. The new manager really liked his new team. Exercise three. Listen for the missing words and write them on the lines below. One. That man was frightened when I saw him. Two. Paula and John were threatened by the Halloween costumes. Three. The little girl had a big smile. Four. 
My theme is no good. Part 2 Exercise 1 Listen to the dialogue on the tape and fill in the gaps. I want to register for this mathematics course. I'm sorry, registration has closed. Closed? The clerk told me I could come back and register any time during the first week of classes. Well, that's not possible. The computer's official student account has already been sent to the state, and that's what our budget is based on. Who told you that anyway? Some woman in here when I tried to register three weeks ago. She said I just had to pay a late fee. She must have been a part-time worker. They didn't have much training. Why didn't you register then? She said I couldn't until I had my birth certificate. Here it is. Huh? That is no reason to demand a birth certificate. We only need to establish residency. You know, a phone bill with your name and address on it would have been fine. Serious? Only the proof of my address? Yes, I am afraid she gave you the wrong information. But it's unfair. Well, I sympathise with your problem, but, to be honest, I don't think there is anything anyone can do for you. You were trapped in the system. If you want, you can talk to the director. She will help you if she can. Great. Exercise 2 Listen to the dialogue again. Answer questions below. I want to register for this mathematics course. I'm sorry, registration has closed. Closed? The clerk told me I could come back and register any time during the first week of classes. Well, that's not possible. The computer's official student account has already been sent to the state. And that's what our budget is based on. Who told you that anyway? Some woman in here when I tried to register three weeks ago. She said I just had to pay a late fee. She must have been a part-time worker. They didn't have much training. Why didn't you register then? She said I couldn't until I had my birth certificate. Here it is. Huh? That is no reason to demand a birth certificate. We only need to establish residency. You know, a phone bill with your name and address on it would have been fine. Serious? Only the proof of my address? Yes, I am afraid she gave you the wrong information. But it's unfair. Well, I sympathise with your problem, but, to be honest, I don't think there is anything anyone can do for you. You were trapped in the system. If you want, you can talk to the director. She will help you if she can. Great. Lesson 24 Exercise 1 Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. A man accused of failing to return more than 700 children's books to five different libraries in the county was released from jail yesterday after a book publisher agreed to post his bond of $1,000. The publisher said, there's a story here. This is a man who loves books. He just can't let go of them. He hasn't stolen a single book, so what's the crime? We think that Mr. Barouche has a story to tell. We plan to publish his story. When asked why he didn't return the books, Mr. Barouche said, Well, how could I? They became family to me. I was afraid to return them because I knew that kids or dogs would get hold of these books and chew them up throw them around, rip the pages, spill soda on them, get jam and jelly on them, and drown them in the toilet. He continued, Books are people too. They talk to you, they take care of you, and they enrich you with wisdom and humour and love. A book is my guest in my home. How could I kick it out? I repaired torn pages. I dusted them with a soft clean cloth. I turned their pages so they could breathe and get some fresh air. Every week I reorganised them on their shelves so they could meet new friends. My books were happy books. You could tell just by looking at them. 
Now they're all back in the library, on the lower shelves, on the floors, at the mercy of all those runny-nosed kids. I can hear them calling me. I need to rescue them. Excuse me, I have to go now. Exercise 2 Listen to a story on the tape. Answer w questions below. A man accused of failing to return more than 700 children's books to five different libraries in the county was released from jail yesterday after a book publisher agreed to post his bond of $1,000. The publisher said, There's a story here. This is a man who loves books. He just can't let go of them. He hasn't stolen a single book, so what's the crime? We think that Mr. Barouche has a story to tell. We plan to publish his story. When asked why he didn't return the books, Mr. Barouche said, Well, how could I? They became family to me. I was afraid to return them because I knew that kids or dogs would get hold of these books and chew them up, throw them around, rip the pages, spill soda on them, get jam and jelly on them, and drown them in the toilet. He continued, Books are people too. They talk to you, they take care of you, and they enrich you with wisdom and humour and love. A book is my guest in my home. How could I kick it out? I repaired torn pages. I dusted them with a soft clean cloth. I turned their pages so they could breathe and get some fresh air. Every week I reorganised them on their shelves so they could meet new friends. My books were happy books. You could tell just by looking at them. Now they're all back in the library, on the lower shelves, on the floors, at the mercy of all those runny-nosed kids. I can hear them calling me. I need to rescue them. Excuse me, I have to go now. Exercise 3 Dictation 1. A publisher agreed to post his bond of $1,000. 2. A man was released from jail yesterday. 3. We plan to publish his story. 4. So what's the crime? 5. There's a story here. 6. They could breathe and get some fresh air. 7. I dusted them off with a clean cloth. 8. They enrich you with wisdom and humour. 9. They would drown the books in the toilet. 10. I knew that kids or dogs would get hold of them. 13. Lesson 25 Part 1 Exercise 1 
distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One. Batch. Two. Few. Three. Dry. Four. Take. Five. Cheers. Six. Won't. Seven. Really, really. Eight. Rack. Nine. Kind of. Ten. Watch. Part two. Exercise one. Listen to the dialogue on the tape and fill in the gaps. You must be pretty excited about your trip to Europe. When is it that you are leaving? In just three weeks, and I am excited. But there are still a few things I need to do before I go. Like what? Like renewing my passport, going to the travel agency to buy my plane ticket, and figuring out what to do with my apartment while I'm gone. You are not going to give it up, are you? No way! I'll never find another apartment around here. But I don't like the idea of paying three months' rent on an empty apartment either. I don't blame you. Perhaps you could sublet it. Yes, but whom to? Hmm. Let me think. Oh, I know just a person. An old colleague of mine, Jim Thomas, is coming here to do some research this summer, from June to August. That's exactly when I'll be away. It sounds ideal, as long as the landlord agrees. Tell you what, I'll be calling Jim late this week anyway, so I'll mention it to him then. Well, thanks, Bill. Let me know what happens. That extra money will really come in handy. Exercise two. Listen to the dialogue again. Answer questions below. You must be pretty excited about your trip to Europe. When is it that you are leaving? In just three weeks, and I am excited. But there are still a few things I need to do before I go. Like what? Like renewing my passport, going to the travel agency to buy my plane ticket, and figuring out what to do with my apartment while I'm gone. You are not going to give it up, are you? No way! I'll never find another apartment around here. But I don't like the idea of paying three months' rent on an empty apartment either. I don't blame you. Perhaps you could sublet it. Yes, but whom to? Hmm. Let me think. Oh, I know just a person. An old colleague of mine, Jim Thomas, is coming here to do some research this summer, from June to August. That's exactly when I'll be away. It sounds ideal, as long as the landlord agrees. Tell you what, I'll be calling Jim late this week anyway, so I'll mention it to him then. Well, thanks, Bill. Let me know what happens. That extra money will really come in handy. Lesson twenty six. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. The thirty-six-year-old bachelor ate his usual lunch at home. He had an apple, a ham sandwich with sliced dill pickle, a bowl of chicken noodle soup with a couple of soda crackers, and a small candy bar, all washed down with an eight-ounce glass of milk. After he finished breakfast. Ed put everything in the sink, poured a little dishwashing soap onto a Teflon pad, and scrubbed the soup bowl, the sandwich plate, and the milk glass. Then he switched on the garbage disposal to grind up the few bits of food that he had scraped off his plate.
He left the kitchen to go brush his teeth, but he felt something wet on his bare foot. Sure enough, he looked down and saw some water on the kitchen carpet. What is this? he said aloud. Opening the cabinet door under the sink, he saw no dripping water. He went to the closet and got a flashlight. When he shined the light into the cabinet under the sink, he saw drops of water on the sides of the dark blue steel cylinder. It looked like he had a leaky garbage disposal. To test his theory, he turned on the switch, and a stream of water flowed out of a seam onto the cabinet floor and then onto the kitchen carpet. Ed had a problem, but he didn't have time to fix it now. He had to run some errands. He put some tape over the switch so he couldn't accidentally turn the disposal on again. To be continued. Exercise 2 Listen to a story on the tape. Answer w questions below. The 36-year-old bachelor ate his usual lunch at home. He had an apple, a ham sandwich with sliced dill pickle, a bowl of chicken noodle soup with a couple of soda crackers, and a small candy bar, all washed down with an 8-ounce glass of milk. After he finished breakfast, Ed put everything in the sink poured a little dishwashing soap onto a Teflon pad and scrubbed the soup bowl, the sandwich plate and the milk glass. Then he switched on the garbage disposal to grind up the few bits of food that he had scraped off his plate. He left the kitchen to go brush his teeth, but he felt something wet on his bare foot. Sure enough, he looked down and saw some water on the kitchen carpet. What is this? he said aloud. Opening the cabinet door under the sink, he saw no dripping water. He went to the closet and got a flashlight. When he shined the light into the cabinet under the sink, he saw drops of water on the sides of the dark blue steel cylinder. It looked like he had a leaky garbage disposal. To test his theory, he turned on the switch, and a stream of water flowed out of a seam onto the cabinet floor, and then onto the kitchen carpet. Ed had a problem, but he didn't have time to fix it now. He had to run some errands. He put some tape over the switch so he couldn't accidentally turn the disposal on again. To be continued. Exercise 3 Dictation 1 Ed had to run some errands. Two. He didn't have time to fix it now. Three. He saw drops of water on the steel cylinder. Four. He opened the cabinet door under the sink. Five. Ed felt something wet on his bare foot. Six. He switched on the garbage disposal. Seven. Ed poured dishwashing soap onto a pad. Eight. He washed it down with a glass of milk. Nine. 
He had a ham sandwich and a dill pickle. Ten. The bachelor ate his usual lunch at home. Unit fourteen. Lesson twenty seven. Part one. Exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words. And choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One. Couldn't. Two. Regain. Three. Notes. Four. Menial. Five. Match. Six. Internal. Seven. Le lead. Eight. Three. Nine. Rude. Ten. To date. Exercise two. You will hear the sentences below, but only one of the italicized words will be spoken. Circle the one word which you hear. One. Her lace was lost. Two. John was always right. Three. The judge thought that it was a real crime. Four. My friend comes from a very royal family. Five. The people elected their hero. Lesson twenty-eight. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. Ed came home from his errands and put the groceries into the cupboard and the refrigerator. He grabbed a flathead screwdriver and a pair of pliers from his toolbox. In the kitchen, he got down on his hands and knees and turned on the flashlight. After a couple of minutes of looking, he decided what to do. He had never opened up disposal before, but there is a first time for everything. The cylindrical disposal was about seven inches in diameter and had a horizontal seam dividing the top half from the bottom half. The halves were held together by three screws. Ed jiggled the bottom half of the disposal. It was loose because two of the three screws were corroded. Only one screw was still doing its duty. Ed unscrewed it. The bottom half of the disposal was now lying on the cabinet floor. Ed thought for sure that it would be full of months-old food, but there was no food, only a hardened, torn, useless gasket. The next day, Ed went to the hardware store to buy some screws and a new gasket. The employee told him that they did not carry those gaskets and suggested that he write to the manufacturer. Ed returned home. He created his own gasket by using gasket sealant that comes in a tube. He applied the sealant, screwed the two halves back together, and crossed his fingers. The next day, he turned on the water and switched on the disposal. When he saw the water pouring out of the seam, Ed knew one thing: it was time to buy a new disposal. The good thing was that new disposals started at seventy-nine dollars. The bad thing was. That it would have to be installed by a plumber. Plumber rates started at about eighty dollars an hour. Ed decided that since the disposal used a lot of energy and the world needed to use less energy, from now on 
he would put his scraps into the kitchen garbage bag. He reminded himself to tell everyone at work tomorrow about how he was now helping to solve the world's energy problems. Exercise 2 Listen to a story on the tape. Answer w questions below. Ed came home from his errands and put the groceries into the cupboard and the refrigerator. He grabbed a flathead screwdriver and a pair of pliers from his toolbox. In the kitchen, he got down on his hands and knees and turned on the flashlight. After a couple of minutes of looking, he decided what to do. He had never opened up a disposal before, but there is a first time for everything. The cylindrical disposal was about seven inches in diameter and had a horizontal seam dividing the top half from the bottom half. The halves were held together by three screws. Ed jiggled the bottom half of the disposal. It was loose because two of the three screws were corroded. Only one screw was still doing its duty. Ed unscrewed it. The bottom half of the disposal was now lying on the cabinet floor. Ed thought for sure that it would be full of months old food, but there was no food, only a hardened, torn, useless gasket. The next day, Ed went to the hardware store to buy screws and a new gasket. The employee told him that they did not carry those gaskets and suggested that he write to the manufacturer. Ed returned home. He created his own gasket by using gasket sealant that comes in a tube. He applied the sealant, screwed the two halves back together, and crossed his fingers. The next day, he turned on the water and switched on the disposal. When he saw the water pouring out of the seam, Ed knew one thing. It was time to buy a new disposal. The good thing was that new disposals started at $79. The bad thing was that it would have to be installed by a plumber. Plumber rates started at about $80 an hour. Ed decided that since the disposal used a lot of energy and the world needed to use less energy, from now on he would put his scraps into the kitchen garbage bag. He reminded himself to tell everyone at work tomorrow about how he was now helping to solve the world's energy problems. Exercise 3 Dictation 1. Ed came home from his errands. 2. He put the groceries into the cupboard. 3. He grabbed a pair of pliers from his toolbox. 4. Ed got down on his hands and knees. 5. He had never opened up a disposal before. 6. There is a first time for everything. 7. The disposal had a horizontal seam. 8. They were held together by three screws. 9. It was loose because two screws were corroded. 
ten. Ed thought for sure that it would be full of food. Unit fifteen. Lesson twenty nine. Part one. Exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One. Jeering. Two. Indian. Three. Loathe. Four. Where. Five. Leering. Six. Can see. Seven. Chests. Eight. Peaches. Nine. Fiscal. Ten. Set. Exercise two. You will hear the sentences below, but only one of the italicized words will be spoken. Circle the one word which you hear. One. John and Sarah were leaving happily. Two. Sally took the bins to the warehouse. Three. The orchard workers peaked most of the day. Four. The team needed Jean to win the game. Exercise three. Listen for the missing words and write them down in the spaces provided. Five. The farmer had only one ship. Six. He had to stead the chickens. Seven. The baseball player heats the ball before the game. Eight. Tim had to have a lick when he saw the ice cream. Part two. Exercise one. Listen to the dialogue on the tape and fill in the gaps. Hi, Leo. Would you like to go swimming this afternoon? I wish I could, but I have to stick around the library the rest of the day. In, I have a ten-page paper due tomorrow. Oh, is that for Professor Smith's class? Yeah, I have to do an analysis of a poem we read in class. That's hard. How is it going so far? Not very well, and I also have to study a lot for math. I don't know how I'm going to do it all. Listen, Leo. I've been doing well in math. If you want, I'd be happy to help you. Holy cow! That will be great, Jenny. Exercise two. Listen to the dialogue again. Answer questions below. Wake up, Eric! Time to rise and shine. Huh? Oh, hi, Jane. I must have fallen asleep while I was reading. You and everyone else. It looks more like a campground than a library. Well, the dorm's too noisy to study in, and I guess this place is too quiet. 
Have you had any luck finding a topic for your paper? No. Professor Grant told us to write about anything in cultural anthropology. For once, I wish he hadn't given us so much of a choice. Well, why not write about the ancient civilizations of Mexico? You seem to be interested in that part of the world. I am, but there is too much material to cover. I'll be writing forever, and Grant only wants five to seven pages. So then, limit it to one region of Mexico, say the Yucatan. You've been there, and you said it's got lots of interesting relics. That's not a bad idea. I brought many, plenty of books and things back with me last summer. That would be great resource material. Now, if I can only remember where I put them. Lesson thirty. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. An elderly woman told the police that as she entered a restroom, she was jostled by a woman behind her. A few minutes later, as she was about to pay for a moustache remover at a nearby store, she discovered that her wallet was missing from her purse. Apparently, the woman who had bumped into her had cleverly stolen her wallet. This type of theft is called pickpocketing. Perhaps an even more personal kind of theft is known as housebreaking or burglary. After such an intrusion, the victims often report a feeling of violation. They seldom regain the comfort and security level they used to have in their home. They constantly feel like they are being watched. They feel that if they go out, the burglars will again come in. They feel uncomfortable when they are at home, and they feel uncomfortable when they aren't at home. Burglars get lucky, or make their own luck. Sometimes homeowners forget to lock all their windows or doors. Sometimes burglars will break a window, cut through a screen door, or force open a side door. Thieves have no shame. They will steal from anyone that they think is vulnerable. Of course, that means the elderly are their frequent victims. Some thieves are very clever. Some are very lucky. All of them make an honest person's life more difficult. It's too bad that all of them can't be caught and converted into honest people. Imagine that: a world with no larceny. A world where you can park your bicycle unsecured on the sidewalk, or leave your purse unattended in your shopping cart, is this only a dream? Some say that if you can dream about it, it can happen. Exercise two. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer what questions below. An elderly woman told the police that as she entered a restroom, she was jostled by a woman behind her. A few minutes later, as she was about to pay for a moustache remover at a nearby store, she discovered that her wallet was missing from her purse. Apparently, the woman who had bumped into her had cleverly stolen her wallet. This type of theft is called pickpocketing. Perhaps an even more personal kind of theft. Is known as housebreaking or burglary. After such an intrusion, the victims often report a feeling of violation. They seldom regain the comfort and security level they used to have in their home. They constantly feel like they are being watched. They feel that if they go out, the burglars will again come in. They feel uncomfortable when they are at home, and they feel uncomfortable when they aren't at home. Burglars get lucky, or make their own luck. Sometimes homeowners forget to lock all their windows or doors. Sometimes burglars will break a window, cut through a screen door, or force open a side door. Thieves have no shame. They will steal from anyone that they think is vulnerable. Of course, that means the elderly are their frequent victims. Some thieves are very clever. Some are very lucky. All of them make an honest person's life more difficult. 
It's too bad that all of them can't be caught and converted into honest people. Imagine that a world with no larceny, a world where you can park your bicycle unsecured on the sidewalk, or leave your purse unattended in your shopping cart. Is this only a dream? Some say that if you can dream about it, it can happen. Exercise three. Dictation. One. An elderly woman entered a restroom. Two. She was jostled by a woman behind her. Three. She was about to pay for a moustache remover. Four. She discovered that her wallet was missing. Five. An even more personal kind of theft is burglary. Six. Victims often report a feeling of violation. Seven. Burglars get lucky or make their own luck. Eight. Sometimes burglars will force open a side door. Nine. They make an honest person's life more difficult. Ten. It's too bad they can't be converted. Unit sixteen. Lesson thirty one. Exercise one. One. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words, and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One. Can't. Two. Lock. Three. Hostel. Four. Horrid. Five. Bite. Six. Bit. Seven. Arrives. Eight. Fit. Nine. Tearful. Ten. Harsh. Exercise two. You will hear the sentences below, but only one of the italicized words will be spoken. Circle the one word which you hear. One. She was leeching when I called. Two. The man was watching the base. Three. We saw a girl with cash.
before. He was washing his car. Five. They were going to sew it. Lesson thirty two. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. Easter Sunday was a cloudy but festive day in Memorial Park for about a hundred kids from local orphanages. An Easter egg hunt started at ten a.m. when a fire engine blasted its horn. Boys and girls, ranging in age from two to six, dashed throughout the park, yelling and screaming, walking and running, and quite often falling down. One little girl, Amanda, found her first egg. Less than a minute after the horn blew, instead of putting it into her basket and continuing to search for more, she sat down. Then she spent the next ten minutes examining it, unwrapping it, and eating it piece by piece. When she finished, she put the wrapper into her basket, wiped her hands on her white dress, and went to hunt for another egg. Meanwhile, Jeff, one of the older boys. Filled his basket to overflowing, he asked one of the firemen to hold it for him, and then took off running for more candy eggs. As soon as he found some, he put them into the basket of the child closest to him. Two little toddlers both saw a candy egg at the same time, and they both bent over to pick it up. They banged heads, and both of them sat down bawling. A couple of volunteer nurses picked them up. And told them that everything was going to be all right. By eleven a.m., the search was over. Most of the kids were studying their candy, exchanging it with others, or eating it. But then the fire engine horn blasted again, causing three-year-old Jenny to cry. A fireman on a bullhorn told everyone to gather around, because a special guest had arrived. Once everyone was settled. The Easter Bunny climbed down out of the fire engine. The bunny was six foot six tall. Most of the kids cheered and ran toward him. Even Jenny stopped crying for a moment. She stared at the bunny and at all the kids running toward the bunny. Then she started crying even harder. The Easter Bunny hugged the kids and they hugged him. Then the Easter Bunny sat on a fire engine step, and one by one the kids came up. Sat on his lap and got their pictures taken. After that, the older kids were allowed to explore the fire engine itself. The festivities ended about three p.m. when the orphans climbed into the buses for the return trip home. Most of them said they had a fun time. Six-year-old Sarah asked, "Can we do this every Sunday?" And more than one boy asked, "Can I drive the fire engine next time?" Exercise two. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer wa questions below. Easter Sunday was a cloudy but festive day in Memorial Park, for about a hundred kids from local orphanages. An Easter egg hunt started at ten a.m. when a fire engine blasted its horn. Boys and girls, ranging in age from two to six. Dashed throughout the park, yelling and screaming, walking and running, and quite often falling down. One little girl, Amanda, found her first egg less than a minute after the horn blew. Instead of putting it into her basket and continuing to search for more, she sat down. Then she spent the next ten minutes examining it, unwrapping it, and eating it piece by piece. When she finished. She put the wrapper into her basket, wiped her hands on her white dress, and went to hunt for another egg. Meanwhile, Jeff, one of the older boys, filled his basket to overflowing. He asked one of the firemen to hold it for him, and then took off running for more candy eggs. As soon as he found some,
he put them into the basket of the child closest to him. Two little toddlers both saw a candy egg at the same time, and they both bent over to pick it up. They banged heads, and both of them sat down bawling. A couple of volunteer nurses picked them up and told them that everything was going to be all right. By eleven a.m., the search was over. Most of the kids were studying their candy, exchanging it with others, or eating it. But then the fire engine horn blasted again, causing three-year-old Jenny to cry. A fireman on a bullhorn told everyone to gather around, because a special guest had arrived. Once everyone was settled, the Easter Bunny climbed down out of the fire engine. The bunny was six foot six tall. Most of the kids cheered and ran toward him. Even Jenny stopped crying for a moment. She stared at the bunny and at all the kids running toward the bunny. Then she started crying even harder. The Easter Bunny hugged the kids and they hugged him. Then the Easter Bunny sat on a fire engine step, and one by one the kids came up, sat on his lap, and got their pictures taken. After that. The older kids were allowed to explore the fire engine itself. The festivities ended about three p.m., when the orphans climbed into the buses for the return trip home. Most of them said they had a fun time. Six-year-old Sarah asked, "Can we do this every Sunday?" And more than one boy asked, "Can I drive the fire engine next time?" Exercise three. Dictation. One. It was a cloudy but festive day. Two. About one hundred kids were from local orphanages. Three. A fire engine blasted its horn. Four. She found it less than a minute after the horn blew. Five. She wiped her hands on her white dress. Six. Jeff filled his basket to overflowing. Seven. They both bent over to pick the candy egg up. Eight. They said that everything was going to be all right. Nine. Everyone gathered around because a special guest had arrived. Ten. The kids sat on his lap and got their pictures taken. Unit seventeen. Lesson thirty-three, Part One. Exercise One. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One. Grow. Two. Found. 
three. Side. Four. Blended. Five. Glass. Six. Present. Seven. Collect. Eight. Worn. Nine. He. Ten. Might. Exercise two. You will hear the sentences below, but only one of the italicized words will be spoken. Circle the one word which you hear. One. My friends had a lot of vines in their basement. Two. His poetry is becoming worse. Three. Her story was disturbed by a whale. Four. A viper was used in the experiment. Five. The cows were mooing in the pasture. Six. The teacher used the visor of the two students. Exercise three. Listen for the missing words and write them on the lines below. Seven. Did you happen to look in the west? Eight. The boaters rowed in the park. Nine. They vent under the floor. Ten. The French teacher said "vous." Part two. Exercise one. Listen to the dialogue on the tape. Answer the questions below. John, do you have a minute? Oh, hi, Leo. Sure. What's up? Well, I've been meaning to talk to you about the situation in the office. I'm not in there very often. It's so noisy that I can't work. That's exactly what I'm getting at. We're supposed to be able to do our preparation. And marking in that office, but have you noticed? Jack constantly has students coming in to get help with his course. A lot of people are going in and out. Has anyone spoken to him about it? No, not yet. But someone's going to have to. We can't really ask him to stop having students come in for help, can we? No, of course not. But I'm not able to do my work, and neither are you. How about recommending him to use the storage room down the hall? Oh, that would be too small. With the cabinets taken out, it might be bigger than it looks. Come to think of it, you may be onto something. Let's go and have a look. Okay. Lesson thirty four. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. Theodore, the manager of the Paradise Hotel, told a middle-aged couple that they would have to leave the hotel after just one night. The couple, visiting from Texas, had booked a room for eight nights. They wanted a sterile environment, Theodore said. They should have rented a room in a hospital, maybe an operating room. This hotel is clean, but it isn't that clean. Theodore said that on the very first day, 
the couple brought all the sheets, pillowcases, and bedspreads down to the main lobby and just dropped them next to the front desk. They stood there next to this pile of bedding while other guests looked, pointed, and murmured. The hotel got three cancellations within the hour from people who witnessed this strange event. When Theodore asked the couple what the problem was, they said that their bedding was filthy and they wanted it replaced. The couple could not identify any specific filth on the bedding. The wife just said, We're paying good money to stay here. How dare you doubt us? We know the filth is there. That's all the proof you need. Theodore called room service and the bedding was replaced immediately. Early the next evening, however, the couple marched to the front desk again and demanded seven cans of spray disinfectant. We need a can for each night. We have to spray the phone, the TV, all the door handles, the toilet handle, the shower stall, the faucet, the sink, and any hotel staff entering our room. Worried about what their demands might be in the following days, Theodore politely suggested that a hotel more suitable for them was just around the corner. He then called ahead to reserve a very clean room and gave them free transportation in the hotel limousine. They seemed surprised that I suggested a different hotel, but they liked the idea that I didn't charge them for the second day, and they really liked the limousine service, said Theodore. Exercise 2 Listen to a story on the tape. Answer wa questions below. Theodore, the manager of the Paradise Hotel, told a middle-aged couple that they would have to leave the hotel after just one night. The couple, visiting from Texas, had booked a room for eight nights. They wanted a sterile environment, Theodore said. They should have rented a room in a hospital, maybe an operating room. This hotel is clean, but it isn't that clean. Theodore said that on the very first day, the couple brought all the sheets, pillowcases and bedspreads down to the main lobby and just dropped them next to the front desk. They stood there next to this pile of bedding while other guests looked, pointed and murmured. The hotel got three cancellations within the hour from people who witnessed this strange event. When Theodore asked the couple what the problem was, they said that their bedding was filthy and they wanted it replaced. The couple could not identify any specific filth on the bedding. The wife just said, We're paying good money to stay here. How dare you doubt us? We know the filth is there. That's all the proof you need. Theodore called room service and the bedding was replaced immediately. Early the next evening, however, the couple marched to the front desk again and demanded seven cans of spray disinfectant. We need a can for each night. We have to spray the phone, the TV, all the door handles, the toilet handle, the shower stall, the faucet, the sink, and any hotel staff entering our room. Worried about what their demands might be in the following days, Theodore politely suggested that a hotel more suitable for them was just around the corner. He then called ahead to reserve a very clean room and gave them free transportation in the hotel limousine. They seemed surprised that I suggested a different hotel, but they liked the idea that I didn't charge them for the second day, and they really liked the limousine service, said Theodore. Exercise 3 Dictation 1. They would have to leave the hotel after one night. 2. They had booked a room for eight nights. 3. They should have rented a room in a hospital. 4. 
People witnessed this strange event. Five. They could not identify any specific filth. Six. We're paying good money to stay here. Seven. They demanded seven cans of spray disinfectant. Eight. We have to spray the door handles and the faucet. Nine. He was worried about what their demands might be. Ten. He politely suggested a hotel more suitable for them. Unit eighteen. Lesson thirty five. Part one. Exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One. Women's. Two. Piloted. Three. Goods. Four. Train. Five. Autistic. Six. Worst. Seven. Rug. Eight. Personnel. Nine. Crowds. Ten. Dwarves. Exercise two. Listen to the dialogue on the tape until you memorize it. After you memorize it, perform it in front of your friends and classmates. Jean Jacobs. Meets the Prime Minister of Canada, Jean Chrétien. Hello, Mr. Prime Minister. It's a major pleasure to meet you. Bonjour, Miss Jacobs. The pleasure is all mine. Please call me Jean, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you, Jean, and please call me Jean. Thank you very much, Jean. Jean, I hear that you are studying in a French immersion program. Yes, that's right, Jean. It's a rigid regime, six hours a day. Six hours a day—that's a major block of time, Jean. Yes, it is. But I'm very encouraged by the results. Good for you, Jean. Well, Canada's an unusual country for its language immersion programs. Thank goodness for that. Yes, and TGIF. Part two. Exercise one. Listen for the missing words and write them on the lines below. It's July 1983. I am travelling between government offices near Winchester, Hampshire, England. Now I came up to some trees and I looked to the left. There was a beautiful amphitheatre there, and I sort of took a second look, you know, just like what? What's that? And below the hill. Were five circles forming a cross. This was cold out of nowhere. It was me on my way to a meeting with this problem or that problem to think about, looking, seeing, and wondering what in the world is this.
Exercise 2. Listen to the tape. Answer the questions below. I didn't know what to expect, and I could see no tracks in the field, so I went quietly, made my way towards the nearest of the five circles, and it was the pristine appearance of it that so impressed me. The whole impression I got from really, never, obviously I haven't seen anything like it before, was that really have been that long, because the plants were moving, you know. I, I, I could hear and watch the occasional one, watch us pop, head pop up, separating themselves from where they've been impacted. What I was looking at looked as if was laid down on one head. It looked in a way so natural. The plants were beautifully bent over and swirled around. There were no marks. I looked for the office places to know if somebody made this. Well, okay, somebody, somebody, maybe somebody made this. So I go to where people would have had to have stirred in the center. And I'm looking very carefully. I'm looking in the small notches of dry soil, looking underneath, and they're still dry and not crumbled. Under my own foot, I pick my foot up and I look, and it's powder, and yet here in the centre it's not. I went and find, find a farmer. He was not particularly happy to see me. He was, he was eventually forthcoming in so much he was telling me they had them for years. This was not a random event. This was not just a five circles in this one field. So I go and I speak to this guy, and speak to this guy, and clearly this is widespread. Lesson 36 Exercise 1 Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. The well-dressed, grey-haired woman was crying her eyes out. She had just been fined a hundred dollars by the judge because a month ago her dog had made a mess on the front lawn of the courthouse. I just got out of the cab and I leashed Poopsie to the light pole. After I paid the fare and gave the driver a dollar tip, I turned around and saw that Poopsie had made a mess. I didn't have any plastic bags, so I said, Well, Poopsie, let's go home. There's nothing I can do about this now. We were just starting home when I heard this voice out of nowhere. Excuse me, ma'am, is that your dog? I turned around. It was an officer of the law. Well, of course it was my dog. That dog just made an illegal deposit on the courthouse lawn. As its owner, it's your responsibility to dispose of that deposit. See the sign over there? I'm going to have to write you a citation. I asked him what sign he was talking about. He pointed all the way down to the end of the block. One little sign, a block away. How could anyone see that? I couldn't see that sign with my best opera glasses. The officer said that I could fight the ticket. He said the judge was a nice old man who owned four dogs. So I said, OK, thank you, I'll fight the ticket. So when I went to court, I dressed Poopsy up in his prettiest ribbons and made extra sure he did his business first. We were both so excited. I just knew the judge and Poopsy would hit it off. But do you know what happened when we got inside? They had a different judge. A judge who is allergic to dogs. And he immediately started sniffling, coughing, sneezing and looking around. And then he yelled at me to get the dog out of the courtroom. He fined me a hundred dollars on the way out without even giving me a chance to talk about Poopsie's chronic dyspepsia. It was terrible. I'm still upset. Exercise 2. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer wa questions below. The well-dressed grey-haired woman was crying her eyes out. She had just been fined a hundred dollars by the judge because a month ago her dog had made a mess on the front lawn of the courthouse. I just got out of the cab and I leashed Poopsie to the light pole. 
After I paid the fare and gave the driver a dollar tip, I turned around and saw that Poopsie had made a mess. I didn't have any plastic bags, so I said, "Well, Poopsie, let's go home. There's nothing I can do about this now." We were just starting home when I heard this voice out of nowhere. "Excuse me, ma'am, is that your dog?" I turned around. It was an officer of the law. Well, of course it was my dog. That dog just made an illegal deposit on the courthouse lawn. As its owner, it's your responsibility to dispose of that deposit. See the sign over there. I'm going to have to write you a citation. I asked him what sign he was talking about. He pointed all the way down to the end of the block. One little sign, a block away. How could anyone see that? I couldn't see that sign with my best opera glasses. The officer said that I could fight the ticket. He said the judge was a nice old man who owned four dogs. So I said, "Okay, thank you. I'll fight the ticket." So when I went to court, I dressed Poopsy up in his prettiest ribbons and made extra sure he did his business first. We were both so excited. I just knew the judge and Poopsy would hit it off. But do you know what happened when we got inside? They had a different judge, a judge who is allergic to dogs, and he immediately started sniffling, coughing, sneezing, and looking around. And then he yelled at me to get the dog out of the courtroom. He fined me a hundred dollars on the way out, without even giving me a chance to talk about Poopsie's chronic dyspepsia. It was terrible. I'm still upset. Exercise three. Dictation. One. The woman was crying her eyes out. Two. She had just been fined one hundred dollars by the judge. Three. Her dog made a mess on the front lawn of the courthouse. Four. I paid the fare and gave the driver a dollar tip. Five. I didn't have any plastic bags. Six. I heard this voice out of nowhere. Seven. That dog just made an illegal posit. Eight. I'm going to have to write you a citation. Nine. I couldn't see that sign with my best opera glasses. Ten. The judge was a nice old man who owned four dogs. Unit nineteen. Lesson thirty-seven. Exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words, and choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B.
one better two wealthy three meeting four trial five little six cycles seven chin eight all nine norman ten fun Exercise 2 You will hear the sentences below, but only one of the italicized words will be spoken. Circle the one word which you hear. 1. The boys sat their bottoms down on the curb. 2. They bought a lot of gems from the specialty shop. 3. All my friends saw me and left. 4. He was sanding some furniture when I called. 3. Listen for the missing words and write them on the lines below. Five. The sea captain's catch was big. Six. The prime minister was sad to be home. Seven. The church service was a real mess. Eight. The gymnast managed a ten at the Olympics. Lesson 38. Exercise 1. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes no. A local community college professor decided to fight back. The price of books for our students is just getting higher and higher and, combined with the rising cost of tuition, it's killing these kids, said Peter Jackson, PhD. Remember, students are one of the poorest groups of people in America. Almost half of them have at least one part-time job. In fact, one of my students has three jobs. She is a part-time sales clerk at a clothing store three days a week, then works three evenings a week as a pizza cook, and on weekends she does manicures at a beauty salon. And she still manages to have a high GPA and go to school full-time. Textbook prices are traditionally high. Adding to that problem, Many college instructors change textbooks year after year. They either upgrade to a new edition or switch to an entirely different textbook. This further hurts students because if an instructor no longer uses a particular textbook, that book has no resale value. Dr. Jason decided to make life a little easier and a lot cheaper for his students by writing his own book on public speaking. Many books have an increased price because of bells and whistles, CD-ROMs, lots of colour photographs and lots of graphics. I talk to my students and many of them, like me, prefer to keep things simple. So, during a sabbatical a few years ago, I wrote my own textbook. I made sure that it wasn't long-winded. I called it Successful Public Speaking. How to be brief, concise and to the point.
Compared to most other public speaking primers, mine is half the number of pages and one third the price. That is, thirty dollars instead of ninety dollars. Plus, it is published in a three-ring binder format. So, when I wrote a second edition last year, students only had to buy the thirty-five new pages and delete thirty-five of the original pages. For only seven dollars, they had upgraded to the new edition. I had a great feedback from my students about this loose leaf concept. Maybe the word will get out, and more writers and publishers will try it. Exercise two. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer wa questions below. A local community college professor decided to fight back. The price of books for our students is just getting higher and higher, and combined with the rising cost of tuition, it's killing these kids," said Peter Jackson, Ph.D. Remember, students are one of the poorest groups of people in America. Almost half of them have at least one part-time job. In fact, one of my students has three jobs. She is a part-time sales clerk at a clothing store three days a week, then works three evenings a week as a pizza cook, and on weekends she does manicures at a beauty salon, and she still manages to have a high GPA and go to school full time. Textbook prices are traditionally high. Adding to that problem, many college instructors change textbooks year after year. They either upgrade to a new edition. Or switch to an entirely different textbook. This further hurts students because if an instructor no longer uses a particular textbook, that book has no resale value. Dr. Jason decided to make life a little easier and a lot cheaper for his students by writing his own book on public speaking. Many books have an increased price because of bells and whistles, CD-ROMs, lots of color photographs. And lots of graphics. I talk to my students, and many of them, like me, prefer to keep things simple. So, during a sabbatical a few years ago, I wrote my own textbook. I made sure that it wasn't long-winded. I called it "Successful Public Speaking: How to Be Brief, Concise, and to the Point." Compared to most other public speaking primers, mine is half the number of pages and one third the price. That is, thirty dollars instead of ninety dollars. Plus, it is published in a three-ring binder format. So, when I wrote a second edition last year, students only had to buy the thirty-five new pages and delete thirty-five of the original pages. For only seven dollars, they had upgraded to the new edition. I had a great feedback from my students about this loose-leaf concept. Maybe the word will get out. And more writers and publishers will try it. Exercise three. Dictation. One. A community college professor decided to fight back. Two. The price of books for our students is just getting higher. Three. The rising cost of tuition is killing these kids. Four. Students are one of the poorest groups of people. Five. Almost half of them have at least one part-time job.
Six. She works three evenings a week as a pizza cook. Seven. Textbook prices are traditionally high. Eight. If he no longer uses a particular book, it has no resale value. Nine. He made life a little easier by writing his own book. Ten. My students prefer to keep things simple. Unit twenty. Lesson thirty-nine. Part one. Exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words. And choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One. Lurch. Two. These. Three. Residence. Four. Cooking. Five. Awful. Six. Fur. Seven. Butter. Eight. Riding. Nine. Walks. Ten. Flight. Exercise two. You will hear two sentences or phrases. If they are the same, write S in the space provided. If they are different, write D. One. He can tell. He can't tell. Two. That'd be great. That'd be great. Three. He saw each and every time. He saw each one every time. Four. It's four to two. It's four to two. Five. It's two to four. It's two to four. Exercise three. Listen to the sentences and write them down. One. He can tell. He can't tell. Two. That'd be great. That'd be great. Three. He saw each and every time. He saw each one every time. Four. It's four to two. It's four to two. Five. It's two to four. It's two to four. Part two. Exercise one. 
Look at questions one to three below and study the grid. Tick all the relevant boxes in each column. First, you have twenty seconds to look at the questions. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. For a perspective on tourism trends, it is appropriate to briefly look at some economic trends in Asia. Asia is the fastest growing region of the world. Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, China, and Korea all have an average growth rate above eight percent annually over the last five years. In particular. The middle classes in many Asian countries are growing in economic power, which rapidly expands the demand for leisure activities. We expect this kind of growth to benefit the med attractions, large-scale shopping complexes, and other leisure developments such as resorts, sports facilities, and entertainment venues. In terms of tourism, Asia and the Pacific Rim. Are growing in importance worldwide. In 1993, there were 66 million visitor arrivals in the year 2000, and nearly doubled to 193 million by the year 2010. The top five destinations are Hong Kong, Singapore, Hawaii, West Coast USA, and Thailand. These were then followed by China, Japan, Korea, Indonesia. And Australia. The countries with particularly rapid tourism growth include China, Singapore, Indonesia, and Australia. Japan remains the principal travel generator in the region, at over 11 million outbound travelers. Taiwan and Korea are rapidly expanding markets that represent about 7 million travelers annually, and are growing at 15 percent and 20 percent per year. The most popular destinations for Japanese tourists within the region are South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Australia. Many Japanese see Australia as an alternative destination to the U.S. Lesson forty. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. A man and a woman died in an apparent murder-suicide last night in Altadena. The man was 74-year-old Dominic Vittorio. The woman was his 70-year-old wife Victoria. The couple had been married for 50 years. In fact, their fiftieth anniversary occurred just a month ago, according to their next-door neighbour, Mrs. Allen. The couple was childless and had no close friends. Mr. Vittorio was a retired carpenter who had emphysema and was blind in one eye because of a cataract. His wife was a diabetic who had already had one foot amputated because of complications from the disease. Her eyesight was almost completely gone. They were such a nice couple," said Mrs. Allen. "I have lived next to them for the last twenty years or so. I'm widowed, and Dom always used to help me with things like changing light bulbs and fixing appliances. They had no kids, but they were always friendly to the neighbourhood kids. Every Halloween, they handed out tons of candy and fresh fruit. But about eight years ago, Vicky came down with diabetes, and things just haven't been the same for her or Dom. They used to be so friendly and full of life, and then they just seemed to get quieter and quieter. She used to come over to my place once or twice a week, and we could talk about all kinds of things and have the nicest time. But that happened less and less as she got sicker, so I would go over to her house about once a week, and we would talk. But the conversation steadily got shorter, and she seemed to lose interest in listening and in talking. 
She didn't say it, but you could tell she was in a lot of pain. Mrs. Allen said she hadn't even talked to either of the Vittorios in almost a year. They never came out. Even food was delivered to them by a local agency. She said she heard two gunshots last night. It scared me half to death. She immediately called the police. Such a sad ending for such nice people, she said. Together in sickness, but alone in the world. Exercise 2 Listen to a story on the tape. Answer w questions below. A man and a woman died in an apparent murder-suicide last night in Altadena. The man was 74-year-old Dominic Vittorio. The woman was his 70-year-old wife, Victoria. The couple had been married for 50 years. In fact, their 50th anniversary occurred just a month ago, according to their next-door neighbour, Mrs. Allen. The couple was childless and had no close friends. Mr. Vittorio was a retired carpenter who had emphysema and was blind in one eye because of a cataract. His wife was a diabetic who had already had one foot amputated because of complications from the disease. Her eyesight was almost completely gone. They were such a nice couple, said Mrs. Allen. I have lived next to them for the last twenty years or so. I'm widowed and Dom always used to help me with things like changing light bulbs and fixing appliances. They had no kids, but they were always friendly to the neighbourhood kids. Every Halloween they handed out tons of candy and fresh fruit, but about eight years ago Vicky came down with diabetes and things just haven't been the same for her or Dom. They used to be so friendly and full of life, and then they just seemed to get quieter and quieter. She used to come over to my place once or twice a week, and we could talk about all kinds of things and have the nicest time. But that happened less and less as she got sicker, so I would go over to her house about once a week and we would talk. But the conversation steadily got shorter and she seemed to lose interest in listening and in talking. She didn't say it, but you could tell she was in a lot of pain. Mrs. Allen said she hadn't even talked to either of the Vittorios in almost a year. They never came out. Even food was delivered to them by a local agency. She said she heard two gunshots last night. It scared me half to death. She immediately called the police. Such a sad ending for such nice people, she said. Together in sickness, but alone in the world. Exercise 3 Dictation One. A man and a woman died last night. Two. The couple had been married for fifty years. Three. Their 50th anniversary occurred just a month ago. 4. He was a retired carpenter with emphysema and a cataract. 5. She was a diabetic with an amputated foot. 6. He did things like changing light bulbs and fixing appliances. 
Seven. They were always friendly to the neighborhood kids. Eight. They used to be so friendly and full of life. Nine. You could tell she was in a lot of pain. Ten. Food was delivered to them by a local agency. Unit twenty one. Lesson forty one. Part one. Exercise one. Distinguish between similarly pronounced words. And choose the word that is read on the tape from A to B. One. Liable. Two. Torrid. Three. Weeping. Four. Lazy. Five, sociable. Six, mass of. Seven, viable. Eight, play. Nine, salted. Ten. Revelry. Exercise two. Listen and fill in the missing words. One. Did he go to the father mission? Two. Did he go to the father mission? Three. He bought four beers at the fair. Four. He bought four bears at the fair. Five. Bob really didn't want to see the poor. Six. Bob really didn't want to see the poor. Seven. Larry and Laura carved their carvings last night. Eight. Larry and Laura curved their carvings last night. Nine. The four girls waited for dark. Ten. The four girls waited for dark. Part two. Exercise one. Listen to the notice from the manager of the student dormitory. Tick if the information is correct. Or write down the right word if the information is wrong. First, you have twenty seconds to look at the questions. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Friend at a party. Hey everyone, can I get your attention, please? 
My name is Sean Price, and I want to tell you about a party we're having for friends and acquaintances this weekend. Some of you may have received invitations already, but I want to tell you about a couple of changes since we started handing those out. First, since so many people are coming now, we're not calling this a welcome party for new friends to Beijing anymore. We're just calling it a dance party. Example. It will still be held on Saturday, May the twenty-fifth, at ten thirty p.m. at Blue Jays near the Workers Stadium. But now we're planning on not ending at midnight, but going all night. Yeah, I know some of you will like that. Now the thing that we think is special about this party is that the profits from the door money is not going to me or some bar owner. All door money will be donated to help children in the area. This means. Will be giving your door fee to help orphans or kids who need some kind of surgery or something. Yeah, I know. That's cool. Our DJ will be a good friend of mine from America, Cool Cliff. And another important thing: this is not by invitation only. The party is open to all. That means that you might get what looks like an invitation, but it's really just an announcement to help you remember the party and get there. So. Invite all your friends to come and be ready to dance, drink beer, and have some fun. Lesson forty-two. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. The city of Armada opened its arms to a new business on Huntington Drive at First Street. The store, called Turtle Dove, is a pet shop specializing in two kinds of animals. The owners are two brothers, Bill and Bob Pigeon. They moved here from the northern California town of Santa Rosa, where they owned an ant farm store called Antimal House. That store was such a success that after five years. They sold it for a big profit. They took it easy for a couple of years, traveling throughout the states. We visited almost every zoo in the country, partly because we love animals, and partly because we were looking for inspiration for our next business," said Bill. They finally decided on turtles and doves. They're easy to feed and care for, and both animals live a long time," said Bob. The store will be open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. from Wednesdays through Saturdays. We think those are hours that our customers will find very convenient. Plus, the three days off gives a chance to go into the woods and find more critters. We never buy our animals; we always try to collect them from the wild. That way, we can pass on huge savings to our customers. And of course, by removing these animals from their natural habitat. We protect them from being devoured by their natural enemies, so our customers are happy, our animals are happy, and we're happy. It's a win-win for all of us. Exercise two. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer. Wa questions below. The city of Armada opened its arms to a new business on Huntington Drive at First Street. The store, called Turtle Dove, is a pet shop specializing in two kinds of animals. The owners are two brothers, Bill and Bob Pigeon. They moved here from the northern California town of Santa Rosa. Where they owned an ant farm store called Antimal House, that store was such a success that after five years they sold it for a big profit. They took it easy for a couple of years, traveling throughout the states. We visited almost every zoo in the country, partly because we love animals, and partly because we were looking for inspiration for our next business," said Bill. 
they finally decided on turtles and doves. They're easy to feed and care for, and both animals live a long time, said Bob. The store will be open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., from Wednesdays through Saturdays. We think those are hours that our customers will find very convenient. Plus, the three days off gives a chance to go into the woods and find more critters. We never buy our animals. We always try to collect them from the wild. That way we can pass on huge savings to our customers. And of course, by removing these animals from their natural habitat, we protect them from being devoured by their natural enemies. So our customers are happy, our animals are happy, and we're happy. It's a win-win for all of us. Exercise 3 Dictation One. The city opened its arms to a new business. Two. The store is a pet shop specialising in two kinds of animals. Three. The owners are two brothers from Northern California. Four. They used to own an ant farm store in Santa Rosa. Five. The store was a success that they sold for a big profit. Six. They took it easy for a couple of years. Seven. We visited almost every zoo in the country. Eight. We love animals and we were looking for inspiration. Nine. We think that our customers will find those hours very convenient. Ten. Three days off gives us a chance to go into the woods. Unit 22 Lesson 43 Part 1 Exercise 1 Listen to the dialogue and complete the form. Now, before we can admit you into the birthing ward, we have to first get you to fill out this registration form. But my baby's coming, and the contractions are getting worse. The baby's not coming this instant, dearie, and this takes just a moment. So, your name is Mrs. Roberts. R-O-B-E-R-T-S, right? Yes, Michelle Roberts, on 85 North Hillcrest Drive. H-I-L-L-C-R-E-S-T, correct? Yes. And what, and what is your postcode? Well, I just moved there. I think it's uh, 32K156. Now, you seem to have an accent. Where are you from? I'm from the Netherlands, so I'm Dutch. Thanks. 
Now for arrival time. Today is the 12th. You should be here for six nights and seven days, so you should be checking out on the 18th. There, that's everything. You can go to your birthing room now. Oh, thanks. Exercise 2. You will hear the sentences below, but only one of the italicized words will be spoken. Circle the one word which you hear. One. He saw a pile of books on the desk. Two. The guard is keeping the pork. Three. I'm trying not to pry. Four. They wondered when they were going to suffer. Five. The copy machine is broken again. Exercise three. Listen for the missing words and write them on the lines below. Six. We peel the orange. Seven. You are defending me again. Eight. His shop was stolen last night. Nine. John did the chief thing at the conference. Ten. The cups look wonderful on the table. Part two. Exercise one. Complete the notes below using letters A to F from the box. Now, we'll talk to another person with a very different assessment of this book. So, Jenny, what did you think of Schlosser's book? Wow, where do I begin? I thought that this book was very informative, very well researched, and a very easy read. Schlosser did a wonderful job of organizing the vast amount of information that he placed in this book. For a non fiction book, I found that Fast Food Nation kept me entertained throughout its entirety. In fact, I couldn't put it down. The history of the fast food and itself was fascinating, as well as the background information on the potato and meat industries, as well as the meat packing and potato plants, added to the reality of the points the book was trying to make. The fast food industry. And all industries supported by fast food companies have some serious issues that need to be addressed by the nation. In addition, Schlosser does an excellent job of pointing out the dangers of not only working for these businesses, but eating food supplied by them. It's scary to think about the dangers lurking behind the counter at your local fast food chain. This book really opens your eyes to some health hazards that all of America should be aware of. Everyone should read this book. It'll change your eating habits and the way you view large fast food corporations. Exercise 2. Complete the sentences below. Write no more than two words for each answer. Now, we'll talk to another person with a very different assessment of this book. So, Jenny, what did you think of Schlosser's book? Wow, where do I begin? I thought this book was very informative, very well researched, 
and a very easy read. Schlosser did a wonderful job of organizing the vast amount of information that he placed in this book. For a non-fiction book, I found that Fast Food Nation kept me entertained throughout its entirety. In fact, I couldn't put it down. The history of the fast food and itself was fascinating, as well as the background information on the potato and meat industries, as well as the meat packing and potato plants, added to the reality of the points the book was trying to make. The fast food industry and all industries supported by fast food companies have some serious issues that need to be addressed by the nation. In addition. Schlosser does an excellent job of pointing out the dangers of not only working for these businesses but eating food supplied by them. It's scary to think about the dangers lurking behind the counter at your local fast food chain. This book really opens your eyes to some health hazards that all of America should be aware of. Everyone should read this book. It'll change your eating habits. And the way you view large fast food corporations. Lesson forty-four. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. The mayor of Sacramento, J. K. Choi, thirty-five, was charged with hit-and-run driving last night. The town sheriff. A freshly killed calf was discovered lying in the middle of Arlington Drive at about ten p.m. A witness, twenty-year-old Emily Parker, said she saw the car hit the calf and keep going. She didn't see the driver, but she did recognize the hood ornament on the car, a pair of bullhorns. Oh yes, Emily said. I know that's the mayor's car. It's the only car in town with bullhorns on the hood. Asked how she could see the bullhorns at night, she replied, "Oh, didn't you know? A couple of months ago, the mayor got his horns neonized, so they have this soft purple glow at night. They're really cool looking." The sheriff drove over to the mayor's house, which is about five miles from City Hall, and found the mayor. Washing his 1972 Cadillac, he asked why the mayor was washing his car so late at night. Because that's when there's no hot sun that causes the car to dry so fast that you have sun streaks. Don't you know anything, sheriff? The sheriff pointed out that one of the horns was broken at the tip. When did that happen? He asked. When did what happen? Choi asked. Oh, good grief! I never even noticed that. Do you know how expensive these horns are? They don't grow on trees, you know. I wonder if I can find the missing piece and superglue it back on. The sheriff then showed the mayor the tip of a bullhorn. Do you think this is the missing piece? The mayor was astounded. He looked at it, turned it over in his hands, and then placed it on the horn where it fit perfectly. That's fantastic, sheriff. Thank you so much. Where did you find it? Where did I find it? It was next to Farmer Brown's calf that you killed back there about an hour ago. The mayor's mouth dropped open. Calf? What calf? What are you talking about? I had no idea. I thought I hit a speed bump. What was his calf doing out in the middle of the road in the middle of the night? We'll settle this in court. I'm an innocent man. By the way. Get that calf over to Lester's butcher shop right now. We'll have us a big barbecue tomorrow at City Hall, and don't forget to invite Farmer Brown. I know he'll forgive me after he tastes Lester's world-famous ribeye. Exercise two. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer wa questions below. The mayor of Sacramento, J. K. Choi, thirty-five, 
was charged with hit-and-run driving last night by the town sheriff. A freshly killed calf was discovered lying in the middle of Arlington Drive at about 10pm. A witness, 20-year-old Emily Parker, said she saw the car hit the calf and keep going. She didn't see the driver, but she did recognise the hood ornament on the car, a pair of bullhorns. Oh yes, Emily said, I know that's the mayor's car. It's the only car in town with bullhorns on the hood. Asked how she could see the bullhorns at night, she replied, Oh, didn't you know? A couple of months ago the mayor got his horns neonized, so they have this soft purple glow at night. They're really cool looking. The sheriff drove over to the mayor's house, which is about five miles from City Hall, and found the mayor washing his 1972 Cadillac. He asked why the mayor was washing his car so late at night. Because that's when there's no hot sun that causes the car to dry so fast that you have sun streaks. Don't you know anything, Sheriff? The Sheriff pointed out that one of the horns was broken at the tip. When did that happen? he asked. When did what happen? Choi asked. Oh, good grief! I never even noticed that. Do you know how expensive these horns are? They don't grow on trees, you know. I wonder if I can find the missing piece and superglue it back on. The sheriff then showed the mare the tip of a bullhorn. Do you think this is the missing piece? The mare was astounded. He looked at it, turned it over in his hands, and then placed it on the horn, where it fit perfectly. That's fantastic, sheriff. Thank you so much. Where did you find it? Where did I find it? It was next to Farmer Brown's calf that you killed back there about an hour ago. The mare's mouth dropped open. Calf? What calf? What are you talking about? I had no idea. I thought I hit a speed bump. What was his calf doing out in the middle of the road, in the middle of the night? We'll settle this in court. I'm an innocent man. By the way, get that calf over to Lester's butcher shop right now. We'll have us a big barbecue tomorrow at City Hall. And don't forget to invite Farmer Brown. I know he'll forgive me after he tastes Lester's world-famous ribeye. Exercise 3 Dictation One. The mayor was charged with hit and run driving last night. Two. A freshly killed calf was discovered lying in the middle of the road. Three. Emily said she saw the car hit the calf and keep going. Four. She didn't see the driver, but she did recognize the hood ornament. Five. They have this soft purple glow at night. Six. The sun causes the car to dry so fast that you have sun streaks. Seven. The sheriff pointed out that one of the horns was broken at the tip. Eight. Do you think this is the missing piece? Nine. 
I thought I hit a speed bump. Ten. We'll have a big barbecue tomorrow at City Hall. Unit 23. Lesson 45. Part 1. Exercise 1. Dictate sentences from the tape. One. Blake praises Faye's faces. Two. Please clean up the pink drink. Three. Is it true that Drew won a trip for two to the zoo? Four. The slow snowfall showed no signs of hope. Five. Today's topic was tropical flowers. Six. The present was a pleasant surprise. Seven. What flavour of ice cream do you prefer? Eight. He frankly clarified his position. Exercise two. Listen to the sentences below. Only one of the italicized words will be spoken. Circle the one word which you hear. One. The team already had a pecking order. Two. The group was wondering about the forest. Three. The rest of the car was too much for Fred to work on. Four. The cowboy's horse was bucking in the stall. Five. Jan had a knack for getting good grades. Exercise three. Listen for the missing words and write them on the lines below. Six. After the rain, the canoeist saw puddles. Seven. Janet put the remainder of the chocolate kisses in the cap. Eight. Jenny's son was caught in the playground all dark. Nine. Fran's buddy needed exercise. Ten. Melanie's shade was provided by a frond. Part two. Exercise one. Listen to the dialogue on the tape and fill in the gaps.
How did you avoid a parking violation? Easy. I parked my vehicle in a vacant lot. Don't they ever check there? Never. Not even in the most severe crackdowns. You're lucky. I've been cited five times. Take my advice. Get a validated parking sticker. Lesson forty six. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. Residents of Southern California are trying to get used to skyrocketing prices for gasoline. The average price for eighty-seven octane economy gas is two dollars twenty-two, almost thirty percent higher today than it was twelve months ago. The lowest gas price in the Southland right now is two dollars and nine cents a gallon at the Seashell station in Arcadia. The station manager Everett. Said the reason his gas is cheaper than elsewhere is that he bought a lot of gas two years ago at reduced prices, so he is passing his savings on to his customers. The lines at the Seashell station often run ten to twenty vehicles long. The police have been here several times because cars block traffic on Horse Trail Drive. Everett said, "I tell people in line that the Barco station a block away." Is only two dollars fourteen, but they'd rather wait and save five cents. It's okay with me, of course. I don't mind making money. A young man pumping gas said he had waited in line for twenty minutes. When asked why he didn't go a block away where there were no lines, he said, "Every penny counts." When I bought this ninety-nine bummer, gas was only one dollar a gallon, which was pretty cheap. So even though I only get eight miles per gallon, I wasn't paying that much to fill my tank. But today's prices are killing me. I drive to work and I drive to the grocery store. That's it. I used to drive around the neighborhood just to show off my wheels, but I can't do that any more. Exercise two. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer wa questions below. Residents of Southern California are trying to get used to skyrocketing prices for gasoline. The average price for eighty-seven octane economy gas is two dollars twenty-two. Almost thirty percent higher today than it was twelve months ago. The lowest gas price in the Southland right now is two dollars and nine cents a gallon at the Seashell station in Arcadia. The station manager Everett said the reason his gas is cheaper than elsewhere is that he bought a lot of gas two years ago at reduced prices, so he passing his savings on to his customers. The lines at the Seashell station often run ten to twenty vehicles long. The police have been here several times because cars block traffic on Horse Trail Drive. Everett said, "I tell people in line that the Barco station a block away is only two dollars fourteen, but they'd rather wait and save five cents. It's okay with me, of course. I don't mind making money." A young man pumping gas. Said he had waited in line for twenty minutes. When asked why he didn't go a block away where there were no lines, he said, "Every penny counts." When I bought this ninety-nine bummer, gas was only one dollar a gallon, which was pretty cheap. So even though I only get eight miles per gallon, I wasn't paying that much to fill my tank. But today's prices are killing me. I drive to work and I drive to the grocery store. That's it. I used to drive around the neighborhood just to show off my wheels, but I can't do that any more. Exercise three. Dictation.
1. Southern California gasoline prices are skyrocketing. 2. The average price for economy gas is $2.22. Three. Gas prices are 30% higher than 12 months ago. Four. The lowest price right now is $2.09 a gallon in Arcadia. Five. He is passing his savings on to his customers. Six. The lines at the gas station often run ten to twenty vehicles long. Seven. The police have been here several times because cars block traffic. Eight. A young man pumping gas said he had waited for twenty minutes. Nine. He didn't go a block away where there were no lines. Ten. Today's gas prices are killing me. Unit 24. Lesson 47. Part 1. Exercise 1. Listen to the tape. Write no more than three words or numbers for each answer. Good afternoon, class. My name is Dr. Luther, and I am in charge of the field trip next week for this class to the Leopold wetland. Please pick up the permission form that was just passed around and let's look at it together so you know how to fill it out. First, you can't go on this field trip without a completed permission form. No exceptions, OK? First, fill in the name of this class. What was it again? Oh yes, Biology 301. So write, so write Biology 301 on the first blank example. Then you can write down that we're going to the Leopold wetland. That's L-E-O-P-O-L-D. This is the wetland that is right near Aldo Leopold's old shack, which I'm sure you are all familiar with from reading A Sand Almanac. We will be going on this trip on Saturday, May the 21st. That's two Saturdays from now. So write Saturday May 21st. Now this next part is very important. We will be leaving from Agriculture Hall at 8 a.m. That's 8 a.m. everyone. I know it's early, but Agriculture Hall is close to the dorms and that's why we picked that hall as the department location. We will return to Stern Hall at 9 p.m. That's Stern Hall at 9 p.m. We're dropping off there because they close the gates for the rest of the campus after 8 p.m. Now, I have two more very important things. You all have to bring your own bag lunch, and you should bring, for clothing, a pair of wading boots. We will be getting wet. You will absolutely need your wading boots. That's all. We're going to have a great time that day, so we'll see you then.
Exercise 2. Complete the table below with information from the talk. So can you give me the latest statistics on deaths in traffic accidents? Sure. Official New York City statistics on traffic accidents provide telling information about risk to cyclists and risk from cyclists. For the full year 1992, there were 298 recorded collisions in New York City between cyclists and pedestrians. Two of these resulted in fatal injuries to the pedestrian. The frequency of collisions between motorized vehicles and bicycles was an order of magnitude higher, 3,520 accidents and 17 fatalities. In the same year, 1992, there were 13,599 collisions between pedestrians and motor vehicles in New York City. 294 pedestrians were killed in these accidents including approximately 15 fatalities on sidewalks and other off-road areas. In other words, pedestrians were almost 50 times more likely to be struck by a motor vehicle than by a bicycle, and more than 100 times more likely to be killed. Indeed, pedestrian deaths from cars running amok off-road in just one year roughly equal pedestrian deaths from all bicyclists in the entire 1980s. Granted, cars far outnumber bikes, but pedestrians and the press would be wise to examine more closely the real danger on the city streets, the huge volume, high speeds and crushing weight of automobile traffic. Lesson 48. Exercise 1. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. People joke that no one in Los Angeles reads. Everyone watches TV, rents videos or goes to the movies. The most popular reading material is comic books, movie magazines and TV guides. City libraries have only 10% of the traffic that car washes have. But how do you explain this? An annual book festival in West Los Angeles is sold out year after year. People wait half an hour for a parking space to become available. This outdoor festival, sponsored by a newspaper, occurs every April for one weekend. This year's attendance was estimated at 70,000 on Saturday and 75,000 on Sunday. The festival featured 280 exhibitors. There were about 90 talks given by the authors, with an audience question and answer period following each talk. Autograph seekers sought out more than 150 authors. A food court sold all kinds of popular and ethnic foods, from American hamburgers to Hawaiian shave ice drinks. Except for a $7 parking fee, the festival was free. Even so, some people avoided the food court prices by sneaking in their own sandwiches and drinks. People came from all over California. One couple drove down from San Francisco. This is our sixth year here now. We love it, said the husband. It's just fantastic to be in the great outdoors, to be among so many books and authors, and to get some very good deals too. The idea for the festival occurred years ago, but nobody knew if it would succeed. Although book festivals were already popular in other US cities, would Los Angeles residents embrace one? Angelinos are very unpredictable, said one of the festival founders. Exercise 2 Listen to a story on the tape. Answer what questions below. People joke that no one in Los Angeles reads. Everyone watches TV, rents videos or goes to the movies. 
The most popular reading material is comic books, movie magazines, and TV guides. City libraries have only 10% of the traffic that car washes have. But how do you explain this? An annual book festival in West Los Angeles is sold out year after year. People wait half an hour for a parking space to become available. This outdoor festival, sponsored by a newspaper, occurs every April for one weekend. This year's attendance was estimated at 70,000 on Saturday and 75,000 on Sunday. The festival featured 280 exhibitors. There were about 90 talks given by the authors, with an audience question and answer period following each talk. Autograph seekers sought out more than 150 authors. A food court sold all kinds of popular and ethnic foods, from American hamburgers to Hawaiian shave ice drinks. Except for a $7 parking fee, the festival was free. Even so, some people avoided the food court prices by sneaking in their own sandwiches and drinks. People came from all over California. One couple drove down from San Francisco. This is our sixth year here now. We love it, said the husband. It's just fantastic to be in the great outdoors, to be among so many books and authors, and to get some very good deals too. The idea for the festival occurred years ago, but nobody knew if it would succeed. Although book festivals were already popular in other US cities, would Los Angeles residents embrace one? Angelinos are very unpredictable, said one of the festival founders. Exercise 3 Dictation. One. People joke that no one in Los Angeles reads books. Two. Everyone watches TV, rents videos, or goes to the movies. Three. The most popular reading material is comic books. Four. City libraries have only ten percent of the traffic. Five. How do you explain this? Six. An annual book festival is sold out year after year. Seven. People wait half an hour for a space to become available. Eight. A newspaper sponsors this outdoor festival every April. Nine. This year's attendance was estimated at seventy-five thousand on Sunday. Ten. There were about ninety talks given by authors. Unit twenty five. Lesson forty nine. Part one. Exercise one. Complete the notes below. Use no more than three words. 
for each answer. Good afternoon. I'm glad you all found your way here. Now I'd like Dr. Wallace to introduce us to the Arboretum. Good afternoon. Although at first glance the Arboretum may look like a park, it is a research and teaching facility that also provides a place for people to develop a positive relationship with nature. When then University of Wisconsin Madison purchased the land, mostly during the 1930s. Much of it bore little resemblance to its pre-settlement state. State, instead, it had been turned into cultivated fields and pastures that had fallen into disuse. The university's arboretum committee decided, early on, to try to bring back the plants and animals that had lived on the land before its development. Though they may not have anticipated it at the time, the committee's foresight resulted. In the arboretum's ongoing status as a pioneer in the restoration and management of ecological communities, in focusing on the re-establishment of historic landscape, particularly those that predated large-scale human settlement, they introduced a whole new concept in ecology: ecological restoration. The process of returning an ecosystem or piece of landscape to a previous Usually more natural condition. Madison was a fast-growing city in the 1920s. Fortunately, some leading citizens recognized the need to preserve open space for Madison's residents. Most of the arboretum's current holdings came from purchases these civic leaders made during the Great Depression. In addition to inexpensive land, the depression brought a ready supply of hands to work it. Between 1935 and 1941, crews from the Civilian Conservation Corps were stationed at the arboretum and provided most of the labor needed to begin establishing ecological communities within the arboretum. Efforts to restore or create historic ecological communities have continued over the years, with the result that the arboretum's collection of restored ecosystems is not only the oldest. But also the most extensive such collection. In addition to these native plant and animal communities, the arboretum, like most arboreta, has traditional collections of labelled plants arranged in garden-like displays. These horticultural collections, featuring trees and shrubs of the world, are the state's largest woody plant collections. Lesson fifty. Exercise one. Listen to a story on the tape. Answer the questions below with yes, no. Homebuyers nationwide are watching housing prices go up, up, and up. How high can they go? Is the question on everyone's lips. As long as interest rates stay around five percent, there's no telling," remarked one realtor in Santa Monica, California. "It's crazy," said Tim, who was looking for a house near the beach. In 1993, I bought my first place, a two-bedroom condominium in Venice, for seventy thousand dollars. My friends thought then that I was overpaying. Five years later, I had to move. I sold it for two hundred and thirty thousand dollars, which was a nice profit. Last year, while visiting friends here, I saw in the local paper that the exact same condo was for sale for five hundred and ten thousand dollars. It is a seller's market. Home buyers feel like they have to offer at least ten percent more than the asking price. Donna, a new owner of a one-bedroom condo in Venice Beach, said, "That's what I did. I told the owner that whatever anyone offers you, I'll give you twenty thousand dollars more on the table, so you don't have to pay your realtor any of it." I was tired of looking. Tim says he hopes he doesn't get that desperate. Whether you decide to buy or decide not to buy, you still feel like you made the wrong decision. If you buy, you feel like you overpaid. 
If you don't buy, you want to kick yourself for passing up a great opportunity. Everyone says the bubble has to burst sometime, but everyone hopes it will burst the day after they sell their house. Even government officials have no idea what the future will bring. All we can say is that, inevitably, these things go in cycles, said the State Director of Housing. What goes up must come down. But as we all know, housing prices always stay up a little higher than they go down. So you can't lose over the long run. Twenty years down the road, your house is always worth more than you paid for it. Exercise 2 Listen to a story on the tape. Answer W questions below. Home buyers nationwide are watching housing prices go up, up, and up. How high can they go? is the question on everyone's lips. As long as interest rates stay around 5%, there's no telling, remarked one realtor. In Santa Monica, California. It's crazy, said Tim, who was looking for a house near the beach. In 1993, I bought my first place, a two bedroom condominium in Venice, for $70,000. My friends thought then that I was overpaying. Five years later, I had to move. I sold it for $230,000, which was a nice profit. Last year, while visiting friends here, I saw in the local paper that the exact same condo was for sale for $510,000. It is a seller's market. Home buyers feel like they have to offer at least 10% more than the asking price. Donna, a new owner of a one bedroom condo in Venice Beach, said, That's what I did. I told the owner that whatever anyone offers you, I'll give you $20,000 more under the table so you don't have to pay your realtor any of it. I was tired of looking. Tim says he hopes he doesn't get that desperate. Whether you decide to buy or decide not to buy, you still feel like you made the wrong decision. If you buy, you feel like you overpaid. If you don't buy, you want to kick yourself for passing up a great opportunity. Everyone says the bubble has to burst sometime, but everyone hopes it will burst the day after they sell their house. Even government officials have no idea what the future will bring. All we can say is that, inevitably, these things go in cycles, said the State Director of Housing. What goes up must come down, but as we all know, housing prices always stay up a little higher than they go down. So, you can't lose over the long run. Twenty years down the road, your house is always worth more than you paid for it. Exercise 3 Dictation One. Home buyers nationwide are watching housing prices go up. Two. How high can they go? Three. That's the question that is on everyone's lips. Four. A realtor said that interest rates are around five percent. Five. Tim is looking for a house near the beach.
Six. His first place was a condominium in Venice for seventy thousand dollars. Seven. My friends thought then that I was overpaying. Eight. I saw in the local paper that my condo was for sale for five hundred and ten thousand dollars. Nine. You still feel like you made the wrong decision. Ten. Everyone says the bubble has to burst sometime. Unit twenty six. Lesson fifty one. You are going to hear a conversation between Angela and Mr. Ray. Angela is applying to join the library. Listen to the conversation and complete the form below. First, you have some time to look at the questions. You will see there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, how can I join the library? Well, you need to make an application. Would you like to do like to do it now? Yes, if I can. One moment, and I'll get the form. Now, I just need to ask you a few questions before you sign at the bottom. Okay. Your full name, please. Angela Mary Price. Price. Yes, that's right. Angela's surname is Price, so in the example, Price has been written down after surname. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will never hear the recording a second time. Hello. How can I join the library? Well, you need to make an application. Would you like to do it now? Yes, if I can. One moment, and I'll get the form. Now, I just need to ask you a few questions before you sign at the bottom. Okay. Your full name, please. Angela Mary Price. Price. Yes, that's right. Okay, and your address? Apartment three, eighty-six Bridge Street, Pimlico. Bridge Street. That's just near here, isn't it? Yes, not very far. Good. So the postcode must be two o six five, right? Yes, that's right. Now your telephone number. I need both home and work if you have them. My home number is eight seven six three five one four two, and work is eight four five six one three o seven. Do you need anything else, like ID or something? Yes, your driver's license will do if you have one. Right, it's easy to remember. I know it by heart. Four o four o A C. I'm afraid I'll also need to see it. Okay, here it is. Thanks. And your date of birth, please. Twenty fourth of March, nineteen eighty one. Okay, thanks. That's the most important part completed. But if you don't mind, I'd also like to ask you a few questions. For a survey we're conducting. Yes, that's okay. Now you have some time to read exercise two and exercise three below.
As the conversation continues, answer the questions below. What kind of books do you like to read? Here's a list to look at. Oh, it varies from time to time, but I always like to relax and learn about other countries I might visit one day. I don't like anything too heavy or serious, unless it's about animals or the environment. I'm not really into sport very much. Anything else? Well, I do like entertaining at home, you know, dinner parties. So I suppose you'll have something for me in that line. The pictures in those books always make me hungry, although they never seem to turn out exactly as they look in the books. Fine. I think that's all I need now. Except I need you to sign here on the application form. Oh, and I almost forgot. The membership fee is twenty dollars. Which is refundable if you no longer stay a member. There you are. Do I sign at the bottom here? Yes, that's right. You can borrow books now if you wish, although your membership card won't be ready until next week. So if you want to borrow today, you can pick up your card when you return your first books. That's if you want to take some now. I think I will, but I'll have a look around first. Lesson fifty-two. You are going to hear a conversation between Bill and the counselor. You now have some time to look at exercise one. Hello, Bill. What can I help you with? Well, I was talking with a friend of mine who's doing a medical course, and he said that before I start taking sleeping pills, I should see you. I see. Well, I can't prescribe any medicine, Bill, and I prefer not to encourage anybody to take sleeping pills. What I can do is to help you to look at why you're not sleeping. Okay, but I think it's because I don't know how to handle all the work. I found that new students and college very different from school. The biggest difference seems to be that you have to get used to working more independently at college, and this can be difficult to pick up straight away. You can feel that you're not quite in control of it all. That's right. I mean, with only a few lectures and tutorials each week, it looks like an easy workload. But then you suddenly realise that there are assignments, tests, and exams. I know I'm not the only one. I really prefer to work quietly in the library, where the resources are. But its hours just don't suit my work and sleep habits. Yes, having a lot time to manage, and having to arrange to get everything done, and still have time left over to relax and feel refreshed, usually needs careful planning. Yeah, that's right. I know, but it's hard to get started. My medical mate. Said you can help with getting organised, and I sure need it. Okay then, I need to get a few details about your timetable. Any other commitments? You can put them all down on this form if you like. Now you have some time to look at exercise two. Listen to the second part of the conversation and answer questions by completing the notes below. Write no more than three words for each answer. Now, Bill, what's your main concern? Well, what really gets me down at present is that the exams are coming up and I don't feel confident. I know you've spent a lot of time preparing, so let's look at the actual exam itself. No matter how much preparation you do, it doesn't really count if you don't plan how you will time yourself to ensure you get to answer all the questions. Usually, there will be some guide on the exam paper that will tell you the relative importance of each question, its contribution to your total mark. I see. 
So, if I feel organized at the start, I can be more confident. Exactly. So, once you've worked out an overall plan, and this can be done quickly, you need to make sure you know what each question is asking you to do. As a marker, I know what answers I expect to a question. Then you need to address the question, not just write down what you know, and hope the marker will appreciate the hard study you've done. Yes, that's important. I can see that markers are looking at the questions, not trying to guess what we know. Yes, and the third point to keep in mind is that even if you know the topic well, you should leave time to go back and check your work for content. There may be an important point you have missed or not explained as much as you wanted to. And at the same time, you can look for errors, including any obvious ones in grammar. Okay, thanks. It's really simple in many ways, isn't it?